Paul, thank mm -hmm. you very much for agreeing to this project. We are very honored that we can be here with you for the Oral History of Tibetan Studies project at Oxford. Mm. And we would like to ask you about your life, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> and I would like to tell you. <laughs> uh, could you begin um, with sharing memories of your childhood, maybe say where yeah. you come from? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, I'm very much a southern Englishman, <laughs> um, born in Exeter, uh, and um, from, a, from a family which is not particularly academic. Uh, my father, mother didn't go to university. In fact, hardly anyone in my family had actually gone to university. I'm very much a product of that um, post-war um, growth of the of the, the grammar schools of people who you know, went to the grammar school. Oh, I should add, I was born in 1950, so that actually is relevant because I am definitely a, what they call a baby boomer, I think, and it also means that my teens correspond with the 60s, and that's important in terms of my background, um, uh, really. Okay, so um, my background is not particularly academic. Uh, uh, born in Exeter, um, my father was a shopkeeper. Uh, went to the normal schools, through the normal school, and went to grammar school. Um, I suppose one thing that is relevant to my story, though, um, and is interesting, is is sort of trauma, really. Uh, now, I'm not going to start telling you all the ins and outs of my psychological background, but my um, my mother died when I was 12. Uh, and obviously that, as an age for a boy, is, is, is a fairly difficult time. And um, so, and and then we, we and my two brothers as well, there were three of us, um, and my father moved entirely right across the country to East Kent. And um, I went to school in my teens at the uh, grammar school in Canterbury, Simon Langton Grammar School, um, uh, under a, a very charismatic headmaster who certainly encouraged the boys, it was a boys' school, encouraged the boys to um, to uh, um, express themselves and their own individuality. And I got interested in my teens in uh, already in philosophy. Um, and so that's, in, in a way, that is, is perhaps the first strand of the story. Um, I was interested in philosophy by the time of my teens, my mother had died when I was quite young, and we'd had a fairly traumatic ex time of moving right across the country, which gave me, from quite an early age, an interest in what we might call um, existential questions, questions about meaning, questions about... I still remember, uh, it probably I was about 14, sort of walking along the street in the dark, um, and I think I might have even been crying, saying, you know, what's it all about? Why, you know, why? What, you know, what, what, what's the meaning of things? Along with that, the other strand in my story that's relevant Relevant, I think, to my development in Buddhist studies. Um, the other strand is that I was, from quite an early age, interested in, in, in religion. Um, I was a choir boy um, from, I think, the age of about five, right up until my mid-teens, until I was about 16. And um, that meant that I went to church very regularly. Uh, twice, uh, twice a week. My immediate family were not particularly religious, but I was. I went to. I was an Anglican, and I took my 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 Christian faith very seriously. Um, and I finally made it to being head boy at the local church. And I like to tell this story; it's quite amusing. Mm -hmm. um, I finally made it to be head boy in the choir um, just after my voice was broken, because my voice broke when I was quite young, which is why I have a big, loud voice, uh, which meant that I spent my entire time as head boy in the choir miming um, because I couldn't because I couldn't sing as a, as a, as a, as a soprano <laughs> anymore. Um, and I like to say that gave me an early taste of the bluff that you need to be an academic. Uh, so so th there you go. But, so, so, but by my middle teens, I was interested in philosophy. I lost connection with the church. Um, I no longer thought of myself as being as being really uh, a Christian. But I was still um, sort of deeply interested in, in things to do with religion, to do with meaning, to do with um, um, uh, um, the nature of things and to do with how we should live. And um, uh, so we're now talking about the age of about 16. So we're now talking about 1966, when of course mm. onto the scene comes Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, um, Jostics, uh, bank, B, 
bangles, beads, bells, you know, the lot. And yes, I was a hippie, <laughs> and I had long hair and wore um, wore uh, bells around my neck and burnt lots and lots of incense. Uh, and I did actually take up transcendental meditation, but not until I was um, at university. Um, so th this was very much part of the atmosphere. It was part of the world of the of the sixties. But what made me different, I think, is that for me it wasn't really just a fad. I took all this stuff very seriously. I was really was interested in religion and the meaning of things and um, um, philosophical questions. Uh, and I am I, I am an unusual case of someone who actually was so interested in those days that. Uh, in philosophy that I am I'm one of the very few people you will come across who actually has O-level in logic. I have a grade A O-level logic and most people didn't, don't realise that there was an O-level logic course, but there was. And um, when I was doing my A-levels, I taught myself logic as well and I got them to put me in for GCSE, uh, for, for O-level rather logic, and I got a grade A in O-level logic as well as my, my A-levels and my S-level and things like that. Anyway, so and then... Um, I went from school in Canterbury to university, and my first university was the University of Sussex. Uh, and that's because uh, I went to read philosophy. And I, I want to emphasize this. And in terms of Tibetan studies and Buddhist studies, my background is in philosophy. And um, uh, not in languages, not in anthropology, not in sociology or whatever, it's, it's actually in philosophy. And by philosophy, um, I mean, or meant, um, uh, particularly uh, analytic philosophy, the ability to analyse arguments and to see whether they make sense or not. Heavily intellectual, heavily rational. Um, and incidentally, and with my psychologist hat on, why was I, from a fairly early age of my teens, interested in, 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 in reason, in rationality, in very cerebral things? Um, uh, and I think that was the way of coping with, with early trauma, to be honest. But... Uh, um, I once, uh, many years later, was took part in a weekend um, um, session, which was actually being um, was set up by Stephen Batchelor, uh, and he uh, put together a group of people who he thought would find it interesting to be together for a weekend, um, residentially and dialoguing. Uh, and I seem to remember it was something to do with um, uh, how to how to deal with Madhyamaka or how to handle Madhyamaka. But one of the people I was thrown together with was a, a lady who was, I can't quite remember exactly, she, I think she was a psychotherapist or something like that. And she looked at me at one point and she said in a very accusing way, you are the most rational person I've ever met. Uh, and I, it wasn't intended to be a compliment. <laughs> um, so, but anyway, coming back to my, my early days, I went to university to read philosophy at Sussex um, and I discovered uh, within a week of being there, that it was possible to, do, to study Indian philosophy as part of a philosophy degree if you transferred your course from philosophy to philosophy and religion, and if you transferred the school you did it in to the School of African and Asian Studies at Sussex. So I transferred straight away and I studied all the stuff they had on offer in terms of Indian philosophy and Indian religions in the School of African and Asian Studies. So my first degree is in um, philosophy and religion from, from Afras, from African and Asian studies. And it was there that I turned out much to everyone's surprise, including my own, to be rather good at it. <laughs> and, and it became possible to do graduate work. So here I was, um, I'm now 21, 22 or whatever, um, seemed to be good at Indian philosophy, background in philosophy. And by that time, by the time I got my first degree, I was married with one child. Uh, with, with, with Mervyn, our eldest. Um, and it was then that I, um, in those days, if you, if you were, if you, certainly if you were uh, very good at your subject, actually funding wasn't the sort of problem it is nowadays. Uh, and I was, I had never crossed my mind, how would I fund graduate work? Um, the idea was that if I got a place to do graduate work, it would be funded. Uh, and so I decided that I would stay in Sussex I would work in Indian philosophy, um, probably in Nyaya, um, and work on Indian logic. However, they were unsure what requirements I should have to do graduate work in Indian philosophy, because no one had ever done it before. And I was the one who suggested that maybe I should do like a little bit of a smidgen, a smattering of Sanskrit. Uh, and they said, oh yeah, good idea, yeah, you should do some Sanskrit. 
So I went off to Oxford to do a little bit of Sanskrit, to do beginner's, beginner's Sanskrit with Richard Gombrich, um, who very kindly agreed to teach me a little bit of Sanskrit. Uh, and that's how I got to Oxford. And we're talking about, therefore, about 1972, I think. Uh, and I was in Oxford doing the introductory Sanskrit course with the intention of going back to Sussex. Uh, and um, then I stayed. I stayed in Oxford. It was uh, um, uh, and, and registered for, a, for the DPhil. Um, and the people who I was contemporary with in Oxford, let me just say, uh, slightly senior to me, uh, um, graduate students who've been there for some time, were people like Alexis Sanderson, who I got to know very well. Um, uh, and... Um, uh, Freedom Hardy, Fred Hardy, who works in Hinduism, who sadly died quite young, who taught at King's College London. Uh, David Smith, who was at, um, uh, went on to 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 uh, University of Lancaster, Sanskritists, um, and um, uh, well, visiting at one point there was Wendy O'Flaherty. But uh, then, in terms of graduate students, people who were slightly younger than me, some of whom I encouraged to to do graduate work in Buddhist studies, uh, Steve Collins. Um, uh, Paul Griffiths, uh, who 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 I, I got to know very well, and, and Damien Keown, who came a little bit later and who um, attended courses when I was teaching uh, some as a, when I was teaching in did some teaching in Oxford, and I seem to recollect that I was involved in supervising Damien's doctorate. Um, I, I I I I don't know exactly in what way. Anyway, so I, I stayed on in Oxford and I decided not to work in Nyaya, but to work in Madhyamaka. And that's how I got involved with Buddhist philosophy. Now, why Madhyamaka? Well, I can't remember why exactly, apart from the fact that back in 1972, with a degree in philosophy, I was intrigued by the idea of a an approach to uh, the nature of reality, which um, seem to be bound up with 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 a strong sense of um of of arguing for what isn't the case for, i mean i mean in other words with, with a sort of um arguing that certain things that we think are the case are not the case but what my doctorate eventually was on was not directly on that it was on the interplay between ontology and and the nature of language in my Jamaica. and what drove me there was that certainly at that time people were arguing that um Marjamaka needs to be approached through through Western philosophy, and particularly through um, uh, Wittgenstein, and so mm -hmm. and, and and the idea that things are um, um, uh, the, the idea of the language game, and the idea that somehow language radically distorts the nature of reality. And so I was very interested at that time in okay, if if the nature if an approach to language is the key to understanding Marjamaka, as was being said. Then, given my background in philosophy, um, I was interested in 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 how come or why, and what I got very interested in was what was the approach to language that the Marjamikas had. In other words, um, it involved going through Marjamika sources and finding out when they spoke about language, what were they saying about language, and also um, what sort of approach to language could one assume that Marjamikas had, given that they were um, writing in Sanskrit uh, and working within a very, um, a very developed um, semantic world uh, Sanskrit, of Sanskrit grammar. Uh, and I, my entire thesis was on language and existence in Madhyamaka philosophy. Uh, it involved looking at attitudes to language in, also in Abhidharma, uh, particularly Savastavada Abhidharma, but particularly in looking at what the approaches to language were in Madhyamaka sources. And my eventual conclusion, and I never published the whole thesis, I published bits of it, but my eventual conclusion was that far from Wittgenstein being of any use whatsoever, Wittgenstein was completely useless in understanding Madhyamaka because the Marjamika approach to language um, was almost the opposite of what people were saying. Uh, Madhyamaka um, uh, presupposed a particular semantics, presupposed that naming terms uh, require static reference. Uh, rather than arguing that you could talk without any uh, objects at all, the problem was how do you talk when your language requires a particular ontology, which your philosophy is saying isn't the case. 
or in other words, put simply, um, Buddhism stresses uh, change and flux. Um, language, and this is part, very much part of um, the, the, the linguistic theory in um, ancient India that, that the Majamikas accepted, language requires static things to refer to. Uh, and that is what gives you a lot of the problems in Majamika uh, philosophy. Anyway, that's all by the way, but that's the sort of thing that interested me. Um, now, okay, right, okay, enough, enough of that. I, my doctorate, um, uh, I spent about six years on it, uh, and during that time I was working mainly in Sanskrit. Uh, I did some Pali, um, but I, and I did a little Tibetan. Okay, now here we're getting on to the interesting things from the point of Tibetan studies. Uh, I was in Oxford from, I think, 72 till I finally left Oxford at the beginning of 80. Uh, I spent a year out in the middle in, in Edinburgh, where I um, stood in for John Brockington teaching uh, Indian civilization and religions and things like that for a year while he was on sabbatical. Um, and um, I, I started doing Tibetan at that time entirely taught myself. Uh, there was no Tibetan studies in Oxford when I first came to Oxford. I mean, none. This was before Michael Arias came. Um, and I started learning Tibetan initially uh, for one purpose only, in order to be able to cross-check the Sanskrit texts. Um, and I was quickly became aware, of course, that there's a vast amount in Tibetan. I don't mean indigenous Tibetan texts, I mean translations of Sanskrit texts in Tibetan which are lost in Sanskrit. And so I originally started to learn Tibetan so I could access. And I can't describe to you the excitement in those days of um, knowing, for example, that Nagarjuna, um, Nagarjuna's Madhyamaka Karika, had a commentaries by Buddha Palita, by Bhava Viveka, and a commentary attributed to Nagarjuna himself, which simply weren't being studied by anyone because they were in Tibetan and they weren't in Sanskrit anymore. I can't describe to you the excitement of getting a Tibetan text and saying, ha ha, he's saying this, you know. Um, there, there was very little use of Tibetan in the study of Majamaka back in the 60s and 70s. And it was just so exciting. And um, so that's why I started studying Tibetan. And I taught myself uh, the rudiments of Tibetan from Yeshka. Um, then much, sort of more um, 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 useful, I came across uh, Michael Hahn's Lehrbuch. Uh, now, my German is bad, um, <laughs> uh, but you could play off the, the Tibetan of the Lehrbuch against the German and the German against the Tibetan and, and work out, uh, you teach yourself from Michael Hahn. Uh, and um, Michael Hahn does say, and I don't think it's ever appeared, has it? He did an English translation of that, but it's never Appeared. Whenever I used to see Michael Hahn, I said, and when is the English translation of your book coming out? And he used to say, well, it's going to come out, but it never did. And Stephen Hodge's book is closely based on, on that. And much later, when I was teaching Tibetan here, I would use Stephen Hodge. And then, of course, I glanced at things like Bako and, and, and stuff like that. But it was totally self-taught Tibetan. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, the middle of the 70s that... that um, I heard, aha, someone is coming to Oxford who actually knows some Tibetan. So I want to underline this. Until that time, um, I was doing some Tibetan in Oxford. No one else was. But I subsequently discovered that there were nevertheless a fair amount of Tibetan texts in Oxford, in the, in the Bodleian. Um, it was when I was ferreting around in the, in, the, in the depths of the Bodleian and the Indian Institute that I came across all those block prints. Um, vast number of block prints of the works of the Dalai Lamas and things like that. No one was looking at them. How, I can't even remember how they got there, actually. Um, there had been, historically, going back over the decades, people, I think there were Sanskritists, the name of F.W. Thomas but rings a bell, but I'm not sure. Anyway, who did, who did know some, a little bit of Tibetan. But basically, when I was there, there was no Tibetan being done. I was um, just... Uh, incidentally, on my doctoral thesis, you, I, I, perhaps I should have mentioned who supervised it, because I came to Oxford to work on Sanskrit with Richard. Um, the answer is Richard did not supervise it. I was not one of Richard's doctoral students. Um, I, uh, fairly soon after arriving at Sanskrit, at uh, Sanskrit at Oxford, um, the Spalding chair at Oxford when I first arrived was R.C. Zainer, 
and I attended some of his classes, the Hindu specialist. Zaini was never keen on Buddhism. He always said he found it alien, but he was a very entertaining teacher, um, very entertaining and, and, and a very, very clever, very good linguist. But anyway, when he died, um, he dropped dead on the way to mass outside the information office in St. Aldo's. Um, and he was exactly the same age as Aristotle when he died. And Zaini used to say no one should live longer than Aristotle. So he was so insistent on this that we thought a great coincidence. Anyway, he was replaced. Uh, he, the, the next bowling chair was Bhima Matalal. And I was supervised by Matalal, great Indian philosopher, which meant I was supervised by someone who was ph trained in philosophy, trained in Nyaya, particularly Navya Nyaya, um, not particularly knowledgeable in Buddhism, although he was very good on the Buddhist, you know, Dignaga Dhammakirti, people like that. Um, but very much a Sanskritist without, again, Tibetan. So he supervised my doctoral thesis, died, alas, uh, far too, far too young. Um, but, uh, and, uh, and um, again, that, that sort of emphasised for me the analytic philosophy side. But it was only then after I'd done some Tibetan, I was, was using Tibetan, I used Tibetan in my doctoral thesis, but not very much, um, that uh, Michael Eris turned up uh, as a fellow of, of, of St John's College. Uh, Michael and Sue, of course, uh, and uh, their children. I think one of them was born while he was in Oxford. And we got to know, uh, Michael, I heard, was teaching Tibetan, I was going to teach a Tibetan. So I was, I enrolled, I was with Michael's very first Tibetan language class. And it wasn't until Michael turned up that I actually learned to pronounce Tibetan. And we often forget this. And I've come across this with, particularly in the old days, with Eastern European Tibetologists, who had never heard Tibetan being spoken. So you go to a conference and they would be talking about actually glob grubs po and things like that. You know, I mean, I mean, um, of course, if you've not heard, Tibetan is incredibly difficult to, to pronounce unless you've learned it from someone who knows how to do it. Um, and so it was from Michael that I learned how to pronounce Tibetan, which was a result that my pronunciation of Tibetan is appallingly bad even now. Um, people sometimes say it's a little bit Bhutanese, and I've heard Tibetan <laughs> say that my pronunciation is a reasonable attempt of a Southern Englishman to speak with Lhasa dialect. <laughs> Um, but um, anyway, so I, I attended the classes with, with, with Michael, along with um, the, own, the other person who's became quite well known in Tibetan studies in the class at that time was Michael Broido, um, who is still, people sometimes say to me, whatever happened to Michael Broido? Um, he was, and that was interesting, of course, I was doing Tibetan with Michael. Michael was a, a junior research fellow at St. John's College, uh, finishing his own doctorate in, uh, in Bhutanese history, which he was doing for SOAS. Uh, but he got this JRF at St John's. Um, Michael Broido, I, I mean, I was there as someone with a philosophical background, basically, but working in, 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 in Sanskrit uh, philosophy. Instead, my Sanskrit to the present day is pretty bad, I have to say, but anyway, that's what I was working on in those days. Um, and then Michael Broido was a mathematics don. Uh, I mean, he was, he was lecturing mathematics at Magdalen. Uh, and he'd originally met Michael Eris, as I recall, because my, uh, Michael came across him um, struggling to read Tibetan texts, hidden away in some uh, uh, monastery in, in Bhutan or, or north in Sikkim or somewhere like that. So, and there was one or two other students, but I don't remember now. And so we started doing Tibetan with Michael. What grammar did we use in those days? Well, the answer is we had to use Goldstein's um, into introduction to modern modern literary Tibetan. So we spent all our time doing exercises on um, you know reading uh, Chinese communist newspapers and that sort of thing. None of which I can now remember. But there was nothing that we could really learn classical literary Tibetan from in um, available in English. I mean, we could have used the Han, but we couldn't have used the Han because uh, I, I don't know um, whether Michael Broido uh, or indeed Michael Harris had had. German or not. I, I can't remember, but my German was, was not really good enough either. Um, I don't think so. Yeah, so I learned Tibetan from Goldstein uh, and Michael and became great friends with Michael. A lovely, lovely, lovely chap, though he did smoke a lot. Um, <laughs> and, and of course, I got to know Sue very well. And uh, Sharon, my wife, got to know Sue uh, even better. Uh, we had young children. Um, 
uh, and 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 they had young children, and uh, we used to sit, see a lot of them. And uh, Sharon has lots of stories to tell about about uh, about Sue and uh, and and their dogs and, and things. So they're, they're, I think they had lots of apsos um, and and you know, the doings and the, the dinners and things like that in 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 uh, Oxford at that time. Um, I even seem to recall that one of our babies' cots we lent them when they had one of their children. Um, I, 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 oh, I mentioned we'd already had our first child was our first child was born when we were still in Sussex in Brighton, and then our next son was born when we were in Edinburgh, Tiernan, and our daughter was finally born in uh, in Oxford. Tara was born in Oxford. So, um, interestingly enough, all three of them now live in Bristol. Not one of them was born in Bristol. But, um, uh, so, yes, yeah, so, you know, we're, we're up to the, the mid-70s. I finished my doctorate in 78, by which time I had a fellowship. I had a JRF. I was the first, I think, Bowra Research Fellow at Wadden College uh, in memory of Sir Maurice Bowra. Um, and that was that was that was a wonderful experience too. And I I loved Wadham. Oh, I, of course, I didn't mention that when I was first in Oxford, I was at Wolfson, as one would have expected. Uh, and I also overlapped there. I mentioned Steve Collins and people like that. But of course, being at Wolfson at that time with uh, Michael Carithers, uh, Carithers, yes, Michael Carithers, who was the uh, the uh, Buddhology research fellow at Wolfson, um, who is the anthropologist of, of Sri Lanka, professor at Durham now. Um, so uh, yeah, so so there I was, and I got to know Michael very well, uh, and I was involved with the first um, um, the International Association of Tibetan Studies conference in Oxford at that time. Uh, I finished um, by seventy eight. I'd had I was a fellow at Wadham, um, and then at seventy eight I got the the job of the first lecturer in religious studies with the Open University. Um, and I, I remained living in Oxford uh, for two years, and then uh, I loved the OU. I, I'm still very committed to adult education and, and uh, learnt a lot from the OU. But incidentally, that illustrates the way in which someone working in Buddhist studies in those days, um, there were no jobs in Buddhist studies, basically, <laughs> uh, or there weren't, uh, certainly not in Tibetan studies. So I was needing to... Um, go into religious studies. The other area I could have gone into was philosophy. And when I first came to Bristol, I was my I was originally appointed to Bristol as lecturer in the philosophy of religion. Um, but that's a little bit of a different story. Uh, so, and I came, I'm very committed to the Open University, but the particular OU way of teaching, uh, which as you know about, if you know about the OU, is uh, lecturers teach by, by television or radio, but don't often work directly with students. Um, apart from with the the, the summer schools, um, that didn't particularly suit me because at that time I I, I, I like students, I like working with students, um, so I did some some radio programs I think and things like that. But basically, I applied to Bristol and, and got a job at Bristol. Um, I came to Bristol the very beginning of 1981, that very cold winter, and been here ever since. Um, so that's a little bit of background there, and in terms of Tibetan studies in Oxford, I should just finally say before bring to an end the answer to that question. Finally say, um, in terms of, of Tibetan studies and Buddhist studies, um, when I came to Bristol, Bristol turned out to be uh, the first university in this country to actually appoint two people who were trained in Buddhist studies. Uh, and that, Because I came a little after Steve Collins came to Bristol. Uh, and I already knew Steve very well from Oxford. He was an old friend. In fact, I can claim actually some credit in introducing him to Richard Gombrich and uh, getting him to do his um, doctorate in, in Buddhist philosophy, that uh, tremendously good book that he wrote on uh, selfless persons. Um, and so Bristol turned out to be the only place in the country with two lecturers actually trained in Buddhist studies. Uh, and so from then on, we set out to establish the Centre for Buddhist Studies. We were the first Centre for Buddhist Studies in the country, um, with Steve initially, and then later when Steve left to go to Chicago with uh, Rupert Gethin, um, working in, 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 broadly speaking, in Pali Buddhism, and me doing uh, Indo, and then later Tibetan, now uh, Buddhism. Um, and then subsequently over the years, of course, we, we've appointed people in Chinese, we have John Kishnik in Chinese, and we've now got um, um, Benedetta, oh, I can't remember now, anyway, since I left, um, in Japanese. 
Um, and uh, um, oh, and we we had um, um, oh dear, escapes my memory now. Anyway, another very good scholar in Eric um, Eric Green in in a young scholar in Chinese here as well. So now, but then the final point is how did I then move over from that sort of background into working um, almost entirely in Tibetan, in di uh, we might say indigenous Tibetan stuff. Quite simple. Um, my interest was my Yamaka. Um, I, um, chronologically, um, having done my doctorate, I coincided with that whole um, growth of uh, Tibetan studies that was coming from North America, particularly with an interest in Mandyamaka. I, I, I coincided with, got to know indeed, people like uh, Jeffrey Hopkins. And suddenly a whole area was opened up to me, um, which, was, which was indigenous Tibetan writings on Mandyamaka. And I was getting more and more interested in the complexities of some of these um, things, particularly the complexities of arguments, of, of the actual debates. Uh, and uh, also, by the end of the 70s, in fact, 1978, I had finally myself um, um, taken refuge and become a, a Buddhist with a Gelukpa teacher um, at, at a Buddhist center here. So I was now a sort of pra practitioner. Uh, and I got to know all the people, um, all the work that was being done by uh, uh, North Americans in particular, who were working with Tibetans to understand may, almost entirely Gelukpa writings on my Jamaica. So we're talking about Jeffrey Hopkins, we're talking about um, um, Thurman uh, and, 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 and their, particularly Hopkins' students, people like that. Jose Cabazon, who I got to know very well, lovely chap mm -hmm. uh, later, all those people. And it opened up to me the, the vast amount of uh, material in Tibetan. And particularly for me, um, and I think I, in some ways, I, this was something which I uh, developed which might be a little bit sort of different. Um, it opened up to me the immense variety of interpretations of, um, of, of, of Madhyamaka that you find in Tibet. Um, there, was a, there was a tendency in those days, and still is in some circles, to act as if, oh, oh of course, incidentally, I also got to know Ruig and his work then, to act as if, um, if you want to know what Madhyamaka is about, well, the Tibetans are really good at it. And if you want to know the Tibetans, the Galukpas are really good at it. And that's, you know, end of the story. Just find out what Tsongkhapa says, find out what, you know, Kedrup Trichet says or whatever. What I was interested in was, yes, you know, I, there's a vast amount of, of Galukpa stuff which I, I needed to um, become, do my best to become familiar with. And that required me improving my Tibetan a fair bit. But I got very interested in what other people were saying in Tibet, which is why some of my early work was on, on people like Miku Dorji. Um, and 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 uh, Gorbachev and Senge and Shaka Chokden indeed, um, and people like that. Because uh, and this is in a way has been one of my main, I suppose, contributions to to the study of Tibetan Manjamika has been to want to emphasise uh, the immense um, um, disagreement and varieties of interpretation. When I first came into Buddhist studies, there was a tendency to say, well, if you want to know what a particular writer is saying, say Nagarjuna, um, you read a commentary. And by reading the commentaries, you find the correct interpretation. Uh, and indeed, they would say things like, well, of course, there was a lineage of commentarial interpretation, and that tells you what it is. Now, one of the things I want to emphasize is, yes, you do need to read commentaries if you want to understand, um, as it were, root texts. But when you do read commentaries, you will find immense disagreement as to what the text is saying. Um, and sometimes, uh, and this is why incidentally in much more recent years, I've worked, I've chosen to work very minutely on one text only using as many commentaries as I can. And that's the Bodhichara Avatara. And there you find sometimes Tibetans don't even know whether this is the, 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 the author of the text, Shantideva himself speaking, or the opponent speaking, let alone, you know, can tell you what the text means. You get immense varieties, immense um, differences between interpretations. Uh, and indeed, I suppose in a way, looking back over the years, that is, has been a hallmark of my, my, my broader academic work too. Because one of the things I do with Mahayana Buddhism, I want to say, is it's incredibly complicated. It's incredibly diverse. There is no simple model here. You get immense disagreements. You, I was going to say, you remember, I remember, you know, the opening pages of my Mahayana Buddhism where I'm precisely emphasizing that. And where I, I, on the very last page, I come back to that point. There is no unified entity here. 
Similarly, therefore, if you're going to work on a text, Tibetan text, let's say the Bodhicharya Avatar or the Madhyamaka Karaka or whatever, yes, of course, read commentaries, but don't think your commentaries are going to give you the, <laughs> the interpretation, which is what people in those days used to do. I don't know that they do now. Um, uh, uh, much more interesting, if you're going to go you know, working on texts like that, is, is to try and work out what is the best interpretation of the argument. What, was, what were they trying to get at? Why did they disagree? Um, particularly, for example, in the stuff I did on the reflexive nature of awareness. Um, why was it that um, the approach to, um, uh, to, to, the, to the, the, the status of consciousness in Geluk sources is very different from that, which you find in, for example, someone like Mipam. The answer is Zokchen. That's what's making the difference. Um, and Mipam has got Zokchen in mind when approaching the notion of in mind when approaching the notion of consciousness. Um, whereas the Gelukpas are not thinking in Zokchen terms. Um, so, but but anyway, that's another another story. But that's so that's why I, I got I moved over into Tibetan. Having said into indigenous Tibetan stuff, and then I got very much involved with the, the whole Tibetan scene, with the whole Tibetan culture, um, and with the history of of, of Tibet. Um, even and, and and other things. I should also say that ling linguistically, um, I like the Tibetan language. Uh, I have to be honest, off the record, I don't particularly like Sanskrit. Um, I'm not a good. I, I never think of myself as being a good linguist. Uh, and Sanskrit is the language for people who are just madly keen on languages. Um, people like. Um, well, like Richard Gombrich, or, or indeed, I think, Ruig, who, who came to Sanskrit through Latin and Greek, which I didn't do. I came to all this stuff through philosophy, um, which is why I, you know, I'm very keen to say that I am, I am not uh, a linguist, really. Um, I can handle the stuff, but I'm, well, I could before I retired. Uh, I'm not a linguist, but what I am is, is trained to, to, to think clearly and to recognise or to, to, to give, to interpret and recognise arguments when I'm faced with them. Now, I, I, I know that there are serious problems nowadays intellectually in, in the idea of simply analysing an argument as if it's some sort of objective thing out there, um, quite independent of, of anything, to see whether it makes sense. I mean, what, what, what sense of, what, so what's the sense of rationality that we were operating with there? But... I leave that to others. You know, what I did in my day was was analysing arguments, and uh, and and uh, and that's really where I came from. Okay, now um, right, I think that's answered your first question. <laughs> Thank you. Could you say something about how you studied Indian philosophy at Sussex? Who was your teacher? Mm. Was there something influential you? Thank you. On you? Yes, um, a, a, a very good question, and and indeed a, a more a general question. Who have been my influences on me? Um, it's a long time ago. My teacher was, was in, in, as regards Indian philosophy, was entirely one person. It was a lady called Pratima Bose, who is probably not well known now. Um, she was a reader in, in philosophy, School of African and Asian Studies, an Indian lady, uh, Bengali, uh, highly intelligent, as Bengalis tend to be. Um, and um, she, her background was in uh, Western philosophy was in, um, uh, particularly I think in in in, um, in Sartre, European philosophy. And funny, although I've I've mentioned that my you know the influence of analytic philosophy on me uh, and the analytic approach. Funnily enough, the Western philosophers I specialised in at Sussex because I did have to do Western philosophy, not just Indian philosophy, were actually um, Europeans. Um, uh, unusually, I, I, I totally soaked myself in people like Husserl and Meloponti and Sartre. Um, and indeed, when I went on to do my doctorate, I read up all the sort of postmoderns and Foucault and Derrida and all that stuff. Um, I got it all out of my system fairly young, which I think was just as well. I'm not interested in Foucault and Derrida and people like that anymore. I'd also studied um, you know, Kant and Descartes and, and Hume and that sort of thing. But anyway, Pratima Bose um, was the one who taught me all my Indian stuff um, at that time, uh, or pretty well all my Indian stuff. And she herself had done couple of books, uh, one, uh, several books, one of which was called Is Metaphysics Possible? Remember, we're talking about the 60s now, when a lot of people were saying it wasn't. And a book that did have some influence on me over the years called um, Consciousness and Freedom, Three Approaches, in which she looks at Indian approaches as well as uh, phenomenology. 
uh, and um, which I have actually used in teaching. Some very, very interesting stuff, um, very useful for, for uh, um, the study of Sankhya, for example. Uh, her book on consciousness and freedom. So yes, yeah, so so she was the one really. I suppose she she must have died now. I mean, when I left Sussex, I didn't really. I did. I went back there at one point to talk to them. I think I I think I talked to them about Hume and Dignaga or something like that. But interestingly enough, she didn't teach me as an undergraduate Buddhism. The person who taught me Buddhism at that time was a graduate student who they brought in from um, SOAS, and that graduate student was Francesca Fremantle who subsequently became um, very closely associated with, I think might have even, as I recall, nearly married, Chogum Trumpa. And she worked with Trumpa on um, that translation of the, um, uh, the Bada Tudra. And um, she, I still remember her. Um, and uh, again, I don't know if she, she's still alive, but I, I think she eventually didn't go into academia as such, which was very much involved with with Trumpa and, uh, and, and Trumpa's um, stuff. Um, and and, and um, so I suppose that I can still remember, I mean, that was as an undergraduate in my second year, so it's a long time ago, even before I was married, I think, which is a very long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I still remember, so, so there was a little bit of the Tibetan there. I remember having a fierce argument with her over Buddhism and, and, uh, and not self or something like that, anyway. I can't remember now. <laughs> I don't really have, I mean, all, any books I've got from that period have probably still got, all got fairly fierce things written in the margins and, and so on. But I mean, I used to be a fairly fierce debater, but that was a long time ago. Um, yes, yeah, so, so, um, I, but then I, I in, in a way, in answer to your question, were these people very influential on me? I don't think so. Um, in some ways, I think um, I was always, and I suppose it's partly because of the nature of the field I was working in, um, when, as I keep wanting to say, there was no Tibetan studies done in Oxford at that time, and Buddhist studies um, was very much uh, Richard Gombrich's approach, uh, area. Um, um, I, in a way, I've always been out on a limb. I've always been um, sort of there's an element of being independent and possibly even sort of self-taught about about me. I don't can't honestly say as an undergraduate any of them were particularly influential on me. People who were later more influential on me in contributory ways would be people like Richard Gombrich. I I mean the whole um, his whole him and his family's whole interest in Sir Karl Popper, for example. I remember reading a lot of Popper at one time, um, and and indeed Popper's approach, which uh, has gone into my own um, um, way of looking, way of thinking quite a bit. Um, and also um, Matilal in a way, because Matilal, uh, again, one of the books that really opened my eyes when I first started my doctoral work, doctoral work was Matilal's, um, the, the collection of papers he did. What is it? Something, um, 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 I can still picture it. Um, something um, philosophical analysis in Indian... Anyway, it, it wasn't his book on Navinyaya, although later that very much influenced me, but the a collection of, of essays that he did, that he published with papers on Dignaga and and uh, along with Udayana and Udhyodhikara and so on, um, and, and Dharmakirti, Ratnakirti and things like that, that was influential on me, um, and, and therefore Matalal in a, in a way was influential on me, though to be honest, um, as a supervisor and also as a, as a, as a lecturer, I never found, I mean, you know, Matalal's a great scholar and a great writer, but I, know, I didn't find him particularly charismatic as a, as a lecturer. I don't think he lectured terribly well. Um, and as a supervisor, well, I wasn't really working in areas that were his direct speciality. And I don't remember, I remember he corrected my Sanskrit once or twice, but that was probably about it. Um, but and then and then the other thing was in my doctorate. Um, so I'm back to my doctorate now, but it is relevant because I was very much interested. I didn't mention earlier in if if one wasn't going to look at Wittgenstein in connection with my philosophy, who were the people who was it worth looking at? And the one the, the one I discovered, I decided um, had exactly the same semantics as the early Madhyamaka was Plato. Um, particularly if you read Plato's Cratylus. And I got very interested in Plato and, and also Hellenistic philosophers, with the result that I was examined. Oh, yes, I should tell you who my examiners were. Arnold Kunst um, was the Sanskritist who um, um, was known to Matilal and her, who'd, he was the one, he was a pupil, of, if you don't know Arnold Kunst, he was a pupil of Stanislav Shire. 
uh, who was the Polish scholar who was writing, uh, working on the Prasanapada, on Tantra Kirti, um, uh, round about the, the wars. And Kunst, who was very elderly, I think he died fairly soon after examining my thesis. And also the other examiner was um, um, Edward Hussey from All Souls, who's a specialist mm -hmm. in um, uh, pre-Socratics. In, 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 and, and I still, to the present day, think that if we really want to do comparative work between Indian and Western philosophy, um, uh, or, or, or Eastern and Western philosophy, yes, Indian, let's say, Indo-Tibetan, uh, we should be looking at philosophies in the West that developed within languages that were highly um, inflected Indo-European languages. In other words, I think we should be looking at Greek, and at Latin philosophy, at medieval philosophy, and I did a lot of medieval philosophy at that time too. And I think they provide a lot of the interesting uh, templates for approaching Indian philosophy, but that, that's a, another sort of hobby horse of mine. I mean, I am very interested in, in, in medieval thought anyway. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's that's going back to the, but again, just to, to re-emphasize, were they influential on me? They were influential on me methodologically. Um, Richard was tremendously important in terms of my um, my my intellectual development, but not directly influential on the work, on the actual writing that I did. Uh, I was then, as I mentioned earlier, I was influenced in other ways by the example uh, and indeed the, the content of people like Geoffrey Hopkins um, and, 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 and indeed Ruig, of course. Interestingly enough, Ruig's earliest work was on the philosophy of language. Uh, he worked on Bertrand Harry, who's another writer who I found very interesting. Um, before then, Ruik himself went over into, into Buddhist thought. Um, Cabazon later on, his translation of, of, um, of um, the Danton Chenmo, for example, enormously influential, that sort of thing. But, but actual direct people being influential on me, not so much. And that's, again, it's just simply, it's another way of saying there weren't people working in Buddhist studies very much. Well, there were in Buddhist studies, but not in my side of Buddhist studies in Oxford. And also... Um, uh, in terms of Tibetan studies, of course, Michael Eris in a way, but not not in terms of content so much. Um, Michael, um, I mean, Michael gave me an interest in uh, some of the people he's working on, and later on, I mean, his the stuff he did on um, on um, um, oh, I forget now the 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 the, uh, the, the Sixth Dalai Lama, and also on on um, the New Motet and. Um, well, yeah, I mean that sort of thing. I, I remember using with, with students later, and I mean that sort of thing influenced me. But I've never thought of myself as being. What have I never thought of myself as being? I never thought of myself as being as being a Tibetologist as such. Um, and indeed, I've, in a way, I've never even, in some senses, thought of myself as being. Um, let's reverse it. I've always thought of myself as being someone in philosophy. I'm a philosopher. I mean, my stuff is philo it sounds silly to say I'm a philosopher. It makes it sound like you're you're something sort of deep and profound. But I've I've always been interested in the search for truth through arguments, um, and in and and that coming back on my story, that in a way is what drives me, is the search for truth, um, truth in 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 philosophical sense, but also spiritual truth too. And <laughs> just in parentheses. Um, I find it amusing in a way. All those years as a Galukpa, and I was indeed. I mean, I I I spent time in India in Galukpa monasteries. I soaked myself in Galukpa uh, stuff. Um, I could have a go at debating, um, and um, I was indeed empowered by my Lama to teach. And I used to teach retreats and things like that. Uh, now I'm a member of the the Dominicans of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, and the Dominican motto, the great influence on me is Thomas Aquinas. Dominican motto is Veritas, is truth. Um, and I, I, I like that. I think I find that ironic. In a way, the Dominicans are the, the Catholic equivalent of the Galupas, <laughs> from 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 Galupa to Dominican. Yeah. So so yeah. So that's what's always driven me. And I'm quite open about that. And I'm open about that in terms of my own spiritual story too. I was driven from the very beginning by the search for for a uh, for an, a world view which I could I could I could accept and and uh, and live with. Um, and and die with and also and for me from quite early on that was bound up with issues of ontology issues of what exists and that's really got you know that was there in, and that's the continuum throughout from the beginning 
uh, and my interest in Madhyamaka, right through to my, my, my now being a Catholic, uh, is an interest in, 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 in what, is, what is real, what is fundamentally real, um, and what impact does that have on how we should live, how we should behave. Um, and somewhere along the line, um, interest in the, in the nature of language got bound up with that. I think that was my first, you know, first sort of background. Um, but yeah, okay, that's the second question. Oh, Paul, could you say something, how you studied Sanskrit with Richard Gombrich? How I studied Sanskrit with Richard Gombrich? Um, <laughs> not, not very easily. Uh, I see, it's a, we're talking about a long time ago, and I was a, I was a young chap in those days. Um, we're talking about the early 70s. I seem to recall that... I think this is accurate. Incidentally, anything I say is what I recall. I can't necessarily vouch for its accuracy. I seem to recall that I started Sanskrit with Richard um, in a class. I remember sitting in his room doing Sanskrit uh, with um, two or three other people, one of whom was a chap, a Swiss chap, who'd come to Oxford intending to do some Sanskrit then and then to uh, work on the pre on the Upanishads and the pre-Socratics. Um, uh, and I don't know whether he ever finished his defo. The other person who was in the class with me was um, uh, Lee Siegel, who uh, subsequently has, has become quite well known in the, in the States as professor uh, and uh, in Hawaii, and who was working with Zena on, um, uh, on the... Uh, um, Gita Govinda, I seem to remember, and the Song of Songs. Uh, and Lee Siegel is the, I believe, is the father of a Siegel who is a Hollywood, not 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 the 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 Rinpoche Siegel, but the the other Siegel <laughs> spoke differently. But anyway, it's the father of a of a, a, a an actor. Um, so yeah, and there might have been someone else, but basically it was the three of us, I think. And I seem to remember doing the doing the the, the basics with Richard. Uh, but then my next recollection is that. Um, and, and again, I can't remember whether, you know, was I with Richard for a year or not? Um, uh, the next thing I recollect is is doing Sanskrit not with Richard anymore, uh, but with um, uh, David Smith of Lancaster. And we were reading the Bhagavad Gita together, uh, I seem to remember. And I seem to recollect, Richard would probably remember this better, that Richard was on research leave or sabbatical or something like that. Anyway, basically... Um, I, I now had a different teacher of Sanskrit uh, and um, I didn't do or need to do I don't think at that time any exams in Sanskrit uh, and I think that's probably all the Sanskrit I can remember I mean sorry all, all, all the Sanskrit tuition I can remember I then went off and started reading the Madhyamaka Karaka um, because remember I went there to, to you know do a quick bit of Sanskrit so I could do Indian philosophy and then I went off and read the Madhyamaka Karaka but then uh, yes now I'm getting into this. I mean, by far the most important influence, in a way, for me then, was that Alexis Sanderson and I used to meet up regularly to read the Prasanapada. Uh, and Alexis, of course, is a tremendously good Sanskritist, very impressive, uh, and, 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 and also very kind with it, because he would, he would read the thing in Sanskrit and just rattle along in Sanskrit, and then obviously re realising that I hadn't the faintest what it was saying, he would happily sort of translate it straight away into English, and and and, and then we would drink vast amounts of gin and dry martinis, uh, and and oh, those were great days, and the sun was always shining, <laughs> <laughs> and then, and that that so that was my Sanskrit, uh, really. <laughs> Quick answer to that question. Would you think that the atmosphere of the 60s was somehow influential on you? <sighs> yeah. Um, well... In your interest in Indian Surely. Yeah, the thing is, if I say, yes, of course, it, it, it's too quick. My life was influential on me uh, in some ways, and that was my part of my life. Incidentally, now, I mean, in many ways, I look back on the 60s with a certain... Um, um, intellectually, not with necessarily with affection. Um, I look back on my time with, with affection, but I think that in, in some ways, things that I now don't think are particularly positive um, were driven by the 60s. It, was, it had to be, it was the way it was, but 
Um, I'm, I'm not, I, I sometimes find myself saying, oh, I blame the 60s <laughs> about, about things. But yeah, so I mean, I was the person I was. I am the person I am. Um, uh, and, and I did grow up in the 50s. Uh, I did then become a teenager in the 60s. I was a teenager in the 60s with a particular background, rather, as I say, rather traumatised background that I had. Instead, I forgot to mention, my father died when I was in my 20s. Um, so by the time I was actually, I mean, technically, by the time I was at Wadham, I was an orphan in that sense. Um, so, you know, so there was a, that particular flavour to it as well. But an orphan with um, married, and by that time... With by the time I was at Wadham, with two children, um, so yeah, um, uh, brilliant in a way, but of course still very young. And actually, I wasn't. I didn't. It wasn't until our eldest son was eight or nine that I had a permanent job. So that's an interesting, interesting thing uh, for them too. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So, so in a way, I think my answer to the question is yes. Of course, I was influenced by the sixties in a way. Um, and I suppose, you know, supposing the 60s had not happened, let's say there wasn't the 60s, um, and there wasn't Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and the incense and things like that, would I have been interested in India? Supposing there hadn't been, you know, sitar playing and the Beatles and um, uh, all that sort of thing, and George Harrison with sitar and, and, and uh, all that sort of stuff, would I have been interested in India? I don't know. I really don't know. I didn't mention it. I did say I, I, I did take up Transcendental Meditation briefly as um as an undergraduate but by the time i i'd finished being an undergraduate i'd i'd, I'd really lost interest in tm um and then it but it, and then it, i didn't become a buddhist until i was i just finished my doctorate so until i was 28 um when i took refuge um so i didn't myself commit in a sense to eastern religion for quite some time. I used to say, if people had asked me, I would say, yeah, I think I'm a Buddhist. I think, you know, I guess. But I didn't actually commit to it for some time. And then I was a Buddhist for over 20 years. Now, I don't know quite why I got onto that, but it's all to do with the influence of the 60s on young people and their um, religious, in as much as they have a religious search. And perhaps, did people more in those days than they do now? I don't know. I find, I mean, you tell me, you're young people. I mean, I find now when I talk, interestingly enough, at the university when I was teaching over the years, you know, I would I would be incredibly enthusiastic about India and Buddhism and things like that. I found over the years with my students that came, gradually the interest in things India and Buddhism sort of began to fall off, fall away. They weren't so interested anymore. More interested in Islam, some of them now. But, you know, when I, I would take it for granted that everyone was interested in India and burnt incense and things like that. Um, and I discovered that, you know, that's not what the young people are really so interested in nowadays. So um, in that sense, yeah, I was a product of that era, definitely. Um, and I don't, uh, I don't uh, regret any of it, I think. Uh, although, as I say, I do sometimes, particularly my more... Um, um, bloody-minded sort of um, moods regret some of the 60s, some of the things that happened in the 60s, or some of the orientations that developed in the 60s. But don't, don't, let's go there. <laughs> Could you say something about why you decided to become Buddhist? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've, I always find that a really difficult question. Um, I, there's an analogous one to why I then decided to become a become a Catholic in a way. I do find it difficult. Something must... The answer I will give is not necessarily the answer that I think. Um, what I'll say is that I, I, I'd spent so many years studying Buddhism that I found I was seeing the world in a sort of Buddhist way. Um, but that, of course, doesn't in itself make one a Buddhist, um, let alone make one then un-Buddhist later on, 20 years later, um, something I, I carried on. Remember, I'd said I was always interested in religion. Uh, and I was when I was um, an Anglican all those years ago and a choir boy, I wasn't, unlike a lot of people, I wasn't nominally interested in religion. I was really interested in religion. I, I really you know, was committed to a uh, religious perspective. I've, and, and in a way, my philosophical orientation which makes me very sceptical, has always had um, a, a very uneasy relationship to my religious um, 
um, I don't like the word search, but my religious involvement and my religious uh, um, interest. I, I'm, I'm, I'm torn in that way. I'm almost sort of schizophrenic in that way, um, bipolar in that way. Um, I, 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 and it means that there's a part of me that makes me um, take up religion. And another part of me that makes me very sceptical of what I've taken up. Um, so anyways, but coming back to Buddhism, I, I eventually became formally a Buddhist by taking refuge at the end of a weekend retreat, which was on Nagarjuna Suhileka. Um, and um, so it was on Nagarjuna. And at the end of the retreat, uh, two or three of us um, asked the uh, Geshe Dancha, Geshe Dancha Yunten La, um, could we take refuge? And he said, oh, yes, sure, yes, you can. Um, and I, I, I sometimes, looking back on it, I, I just finished my doctorate. Uh, I was still at Oxford. Um, and somehow, looking back on it, it was bound up with where I was at that stage, I suppose, in a way. I was studying Madhyamaka. I just finished my doctorate. My father had died the year before. Um, somehow... Becoming a Galupa after a course on Nagarjuna was both seen like the thing to do. On the other hand, in a way, and this is important, I think, in a way, um, it flattered me. I was very knowledgeable by that time on all this stuff. Um, and that carried on over the next 20 years. Yes, I really knew this stuff. Um, and so in a way... Um, it it, it 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 was um a type of it was a type of pride i think in a way um i i slightly tangential to that but i remember many years later certainly after i was no longer a buddhist um having i i, I quite often people get in touch with me um just asking me about my story by email or whatever or asking me about you know how on earth can i be so mad as to be catholic and things like that and i was actually um contacted by a Western woman, only by email, so I'd never met her, who was a, a Gulupa nun, uh, and she was asking me something about, about Catholicism. And I replied with quite a lot of stuff to do with different um, uh, interpretations of, of the Prasanapada, um, because she, she was a Gulupa nun. Um, and she got back and said, goodness gracious, you really know your stuff, don't you? And I said, oh, yes, I do really know my stuff. I did. I don't, I've forgotten most of it now. But, yeah, I did, I did know my stuff, intellectually. Um, not as well as, as as a lot of people, of course, but I, but I yeah, and I and I think there was that element in it. I mean, I, I knew that stuff. Um, it made sense. It made it didn't make sense. I don't know. Anyway, I became a glupa and subsequently ran weekend retreats on meditating through the Majjhima Karaka or or stuff on reason and and uh, yeah, reason and 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 uh, practice and so on um, over the years had a whole gamut of initiations and spent time in Dharamsala, time in um, Draper and Lusaling down in the south uh, as well. Um, there studying, teaching. Uh, at one point I was teaching English as a foreign language in Draper, down in the south a bit. Um, and worked worked at the Library of Tibet and works of, Ar of Ar archives. Basically, it was also bound up with yeah. Let's also put it this way because I mean I'm I'm very sensitive to the to the unclarity in my own thought about becoming a Buddhist or about when I was a Buddhist. It was also bound up with something about me at that time, feeling that, and I you know I want to be realistic here. Feeling that it gave my academic work a certain type of credibility as well. I don't know why, because there's no logical reason why it should. Um, after all, you know, arguments are arguments, and that's got nothing to do with whether one happens to be a believer. Um, but somehow, something said to me, when my first edition of Mahayana Buddhism came out, the first edition, the blue one with the black cover, um, I made a, it made a point, I made a point of, 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 of saying, I am a Buddhist practitioner. And somehow that gave it a... I, did, I, wasn't, I wasn't doing it self-consciously. I wasn't self-consciously thinking, oh, oh, so I'm a Buddhist practitioner, that'll make it look good. But something about me was, was wanting to say, my stuff has a particular credibility. 
And it's, it, that even might have something to do with what was in the air at that time. I don't know. Because, I mean, we need, we need to remember that later on, or overlapping also, I mean, this whole, I think, tremendously important thing in the history of the study of Tibetan studies, this whole thing that's happening in North America with people like Jeffrey Hopkins, um, was also coming from a very different world from the world that I was coming from, um, where they had lived and worked with Tibetan lamas and were themselves... Um, practitioners in some sense. Certainly Jose Cabazon was, of course, he was a monk. Um, and so was Thurman. Um, and um, they were coming at this whole thing of Tibetan Buddhist studies and the whole thing of of the study of Tibetan philosophy, Tibetan well, Majamaka, um, from a very different world from mine. Uh, and I want to emphasize that. They had studied this stuff um, directly with lamas and they learned to speak the language. A thing which I never did. Well, I tried, but I'm really good at it. Um, whereas I come at it very much as from the world of the study of classical philosophy. In other words, how we study Greek philosophy, for example, where you learn the language to read the texts, but you don't think of actually speaking the stuff. I learned Tibetan to read, um, not to speak. Um, a thing which, incidentally, over the years, I felt a bit guilty about. I have tried to learn to speak it, but uh, it was it was too late, really. Um, and um, for my own academic work, it was never directly important. I was always working on texts. Uh, but yeah, but I do want to emphasise how, because I think young people in particular now who come into the study of Tibetan religions um, don't always realise that there are different... Um, historically, been different ways of coming into it. I came into it through the, the, the study of class, philosophy, classical languages, Sanskrit, and texts. Um, it's different from the way in which people like Jeffrey Hopkins and Thurman and, and, and those. And, and over the years, um, I've, I would say I've much admired what they've done and where they come from with a certain hint of jealousy about it. Um, really, their their ability, their fluency with the with the, the the indigenous material. So there may have been a little bit about that in me as well at that time. It's terribly difficult. I mean, how do we how do we know our own motives if we're trying to be honest, looking back on things, particularly given you know, given my own story, um, and 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 change and and you know I don't I don't hide the fact that throughout a lot of this I was interested in religion and interested and and of course I have rather made um, made it. Um, gone public on my own change of religion as <laughs> much as much as I'm annoyed of some in some people in some circles but generally people have been very charitable yeah so why the Gelug school why Gelug uh, <laughs> um, um, yes indeed why Gelug because given that a lot of my academic work was not in Gelug and intentionally so um, I think probably um, two two things come to my mind there one is that um, in terms of the study of Majamaka, it was Galukpas that were that were in the air at that time you know Ev Hopkins Cavazon and people and Thurman and people like that were busy studying I mean you know, the, the and, and also just the sheer I, I mentioned the excitement earlier I still remember in Oxford and I must have still be I was still at Wolfson because I remember um saving up and going out one day just before the shops closed to go to um Blackwell's to buy that translation that Alex Wayman did of the of the Lamrim Chenmo uh, and going back with that I went through it really carefully with the Tibetan text and annotating the margins my my copy no doubt is now some uh, has, is off in some second-hand shop or another because it would have been one of the books I gave away. But annotating it and writing the photos and so on, and the sheer excitement of seeing all this stuff on Madhyamaka, you know, the the Hatong section of the Lamrim Chenlo. Um, so uh, the Galuks were the people in the air. So that's the one in terms of the interpretation. This was long before. I mean, long before people were studying. Um, uh, at least as far as I know. Uh, or things like that. And if you wanted to know about uh, Kagyu approaches to Majamaka, you really had to look at, you know, what they were saying about the nature of mind or something like that. There wasn't, you know, the idea, uh, people didn't even know. I didn't know that, for example, Mika Dorji had written that enormous commentary to the Bodhicara Avatara, uh, to the, the Majamaka Avatara, um, that I subsequently worked on, more or less slightly. I think I was the first person to work work on the actual philosophy of Mikio Dorji, uh, my young philosophy. I mean, had worked on him as a, as a figure slightly before me. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and those figures, um, people who I later spent a lot of time working on, 
uh, on, for my own research. But this was long before any of that. So if you, if you were doing my Jamaica, the Galukpas were the obvious ones. Moreover, it was at that time that I was beginning to formulate my um, position, which I mentioned earlier, which of, of, the, of the sheer variety of interpretations. At that, at that time, people would say, would say, or would imply, people like Hopkins would certainly imply, look, if you want to really know my Jamaica, you go to Tibetans. If you go to Tibetans, you go to Galukpas. If you go to Galukpas, you go to Tsongkhapa. Uh, oh, and we'll frankly, um, you know, and, and that's it pretty well. And fortunately, well, I mean, you know, that was an important stage of the study, but that has now changed. Um, and we've now realised that the you know, that even the interpretation of someone like Tsongkhapa within the Galukpa is hotly debated on the minute level. If you start looking at the, the various Yipcha and so on, um, which, which, which I, again, was something that I later did. So anyway, so that's one thing. The other thing was, I was study. I, I was. I, I took refuge in in a Galupa center, <laughs> but with a geshe, and and that was the other thing. You know, um, we we we. If you're interested in practicing Tibetan, uh, Tibetan religion, and you are interested in Majamaka thought, um, at least in those days, by and large. You go and find yourself, and, and you, you're doing that sort of thing. You you go and study with the Geshe, and they're all likely all be Galupas. If you're interested in other sorts of things, you might you know, find your Numa, your your Numa and do Zopchen and all that sort of thing. Now I realise that's all highly simplistic and naive, um, and after all, I for, as someone who's done a lot of work on and indeed written a book on Mipam, um, I'm perfectly aware that there's plenty of Majamaka in other other areas too. I mean, Mipam, Mipam studied a lot of his Majamaka in Galupa. In, in Galupa monasteries, <laughs> but, but but yes, but and I'm talking about what was ha what it was like then. You know what was happening then in those days, all those years ago, <laughs> long time ago. Did you meet Trungpa? No, I didn't. Trungpa was at. It's often said in in things on Trungpa Rinpoche that that he was at Oxford, and he was. He lived at Oxford, but I think. I, 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 I don't, can't remember enough. This was before my time. Um, but I also think it is it is mi probably misleading to say he studied at Oxford University, which I think is sometimes said. Uh, he might have done something somewhere <laughs> in Oxford, but um, I don't believe he was ever uh, studied at Oxford University. But I can't honestly say. That's always been my feeling. But he'd, he'd left Oxford way before before my time. And in fact, when I was at Oxford, there were no... I mean, as I say, we had... Tibetan visitors um, brought in by Michael Aris for the the conferences. Um, as I remember, the, the the big one, the 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 International Association of Tibetan Studies conference in the late seventies. Particularly, the, the 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 figures there were were Pumbo, um, and Per Kvena was very much involved with that sort of stuff. Um, um, and I was also there quite early on when the Dalai Lama came, first 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 visit to this country, to Oxford, I was there. That must have been pretty early on because I remember sort of being one of those, because I was a graduate student there, being one of those in awe, um, taken along to a relatively small group with the Dalai Lama, um, where he met with Oxford academics and um, uh, Zena was still alive, the sporting chair, because Zena, at that time to my horror, um, questioned what the Dalai Lama was saying. I think the Dalai Lama at one point said something about God, and Zainer replied, well, that would be your idea of God, or something like that. And I remember thinking, that's awful, you can't possibly say things like that, uh, the Dalai Lama. Um, since, I mean, I've met the Dalai Lama several times since, and indeed been in very small company uh, groups with him, and I would, in some ways, now rather echo, echo Zainer on that. But um, but anyway, that was all those years ago. But but basically, there, there wasn't Tibetan study, and they weren't Tibetans. Um, we had some contact at that time through Richard with um, with Theravadin uh, monks. Um, I remember. Uh, um, I think Thai and uh, Sinhalese, but 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 nothing else really. No, I mean you know, Oxford at that time was well, it was Oxford, and it was uh, Buddhist studies. Really, was Richard. Um, and and what he was doing, and then later in a in a in a slightly different way, of course, because it was really history, was when Michael Harris turned up, plus you know me and people who were doing what we were doing, and then and then Matilal in the way that Matilal did, but Matilal was primarily working in in logic and epistemology, and mainly Hindu logic and epistemology. So and that was it. 
So we didn't have lamas, we didn't have people um, um, studying Tibetan much, we didn't have people going around speaking Tibetan, good gracious, none of that, uh, really, at all. And it, I mean, it is, it is worth remembering that people who have subsequently developed Tibetan studies in Oxford, I mean, I think of people like, like Robert, Rob Mayer, um, came to do their degree with us here in Bristol. Um, their first degree, and then went off, on and, and, and started to do, and in fact Rob, Rob did the degree, did all the Buddhist stuff with us here, and his first degree is in, um, well it would be in our degree wouldn't it, so in, technically it would be Theology and Religious Studies, and then he went off and did, did um, the Tibetan things, uh, um, and, and studied Tibetan subsequently. On the other hand, when I was there, when I was in Oxford in the 70s, I'll tell you an example of someone who did come who was very much in Tibetan studies. Actually, I'm starting to think now later on when I was there, because I actually ended up supervising her. And that was, um, um, well, her, her, um, her actual name is Shen Pen Hukum. But she um, did that book on the Tathagatagarbha theory for her doctorate, which was published by SUNY. And she was a nun when I first knew her. Uh, and she then um, um, left being nun, came to Oxford, did her doctorate, she was from a Kirkgu background, um, a Westerner, actually from Northern Ireland, I think, and she um, brought out that book on the, on the uh, she was very keen on and promoted, and really with a, with a certain sort of almost, almost theological fervour, the idea of the Zhentong interpretation of the Tathagatagarbha, which subsequently I also got quite interested in, because... Um, uh, that was that was in a way an opening up of an area which I hadn't had not properly realised because I'd done all this Galupa stuff which is as Rangdong and and of course you know and 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 the whole of um, if you wanted to study the Tathagatagarbha in those days you would tend to look at um, at Ruig's work and of, of course very influenced by by Um and it was it was Hookham really was that was one of the very first books in English. Um, really, that was pointing out. Well, actually, there is a whole different way of interpreting this stuff, uh, and she was she was using. Um, um, no, Tibetan's very good, and she was using. Um, um, who is she using? She, she's using Kaku writers. I've forgotten now um, the ones, but anyway. So, so yeah. So I actually supervised that thesis at Oxford. That was right late on, because um, well, because there's no one else doing anything in Tibetan, uh, really, and so um, if, if anyone came to do anything in Tibetan, then I was the only person really around. But that would have been, I forget the exact chronology, that must have been by then, if I was supervising that, and I remember where I was living at the time, that must have been right at the very end of the 70s, when I was already a fellow and then had a you know, permanent teaching job with the Open University, so that would have been why I was, I was supervising at that time. Um, as I said, I might have said earlier, I also vaguely recollect, but I don't think I was a supervisor. I had something to do with teaching Damien Keown as well for his thesis. I think I might have been a supervisor. He didn't finish it till sometime after leaving Oxford, though. I think I might have supervised that. I can't remember. They would remember. I ought to remember, but I can't. Um, and then, funnily enough, also in those late 70s, the other person I was supervising was not a doctor at all. It was the one and only person who ever did a degree, a doctorate in Indian philosophy, I think, um, w w with the Open University, because I was at the Open University. And that was a very nice lady called Joy Lane, who has taught for many years now at a, um, in, um, in the USA. And what, But what's interesting about that is just, just to show what I was doing at that time, is that I supervised her entirely, um, and her thesis was on... Um, Udayana. So it was on, it was on Nyaya. Uh, I, I think, yes, it was, it, it, she worked on the Atma Tattva Viveka. So basically Nyaya defence against the Buddhists of, of the self uh, and was examined by, by Matalao before he died, I seem to recall. Um, so that's interesting that, you know, and I think she's a very good Sanskritist um, and she to the present day. I, 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 was, I met up with her again just a couple of years ago. Very nice person. Um, she, I think, is the only... I've, I've, examined, I've examined and um, um, supervised a fair number of doctorates over the years. She's the only one I think I've ever done outside Buddhist studies. I don't think I've ever done anyone in, an, in another area. Yeah. 
I, I, I wouldn't do it. I should say I wouldn't do it now. I wouldn't do it now anyway. But I mean, I, I over the years I would tend to not not to want to supervise outside things that I felt reasonably comfortable with. But then over the years, I've also learned more from my graduate students than I've ever contributed to their work, I think. Hmm. But I've, I've uh, yeah, supervised a fair number of different things, um, really, in, in mainly in, in uh, Indian Mahayana or in, in Madhyamika or in Tibetan stuff. Yeah. What happened afterwards, after your PhD? What happened after it? Well, of course, I got yes. I mean, I got I, I got my DPhil um, in seventy eight, I think it was. By which time, seventy eight, yes, was it seventy eight? By which time, actually, when I, my DPhil finally came through, um, I never attended the degree ceremony because I was in India. Uh, I was already working for the Open University, and I made I made my first trip to India uh, finally, um, and I was actually an advisor on a film, a BBC film on Hindu Hinduism in a in a village in um near near Varanasi. And I went to India and then spent a bit of time in Nepal. Um because of my OU connection. So I was basically working with the OU stroke BBC. Uh, and that was a really interesting experience. I mean just being in India was an interesting experience. Gosh, you know, after all these years studying it, I finally saw what the place is like. Um and it slightly reminded me when I was an undergraduate, one of the people who started with me at the same time um at, in Sussex studying uh philosophy and religion, during his summer vacation went off to India and came back and said, I'm not interested in philosophy and religion at all anymore. And he transferred to politics, I think. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I, I but at, at that time, yes, there I was in India and I, I spent time with Tibetans then and also was able to visit Sarnat and, and places like that and Bodhgaya um, and, and see the country. But having said that, I mean, in terms of my own background, um, and it relates to things I said earlier, um, I haven't been to India that much, and I haven't been to Tibet at all. Funny enough, one of my sons has. Um, I've lived with, with Tibetans in North India and in the South, but not for long periods of time. But then um, I'm not an anthropologist. Um, my work is very heavily textual. And so in that sense, um, my own research never particularly needed to go to India in that sense. Um, although, I, I, as I said, I did over the years several times. Um, but yeah, so anyway, so having finished my doctorate, yes, I, was, I, I, I didn't actually go to the degree ceremony at all. In fact, the first time I ever wore my Oxford doctoral gowns were when I had to do it here for um, degree ceremonies here. Um, they were quite, quite bright and impressive, I thought, but I, I'd never worn them when I was, <laughs> when I was uh, uh, at, at Oxford. Um, and, then, um, and then, as I say, I carried on living in Oxford for two years after finishing because my job at the Open University meant I was technically based in Milton Keynes. Um, well, with the best will in the world, you wouldn't particularly, if you had a choice, want to move from Oxford to Milton Keynes. <laughs> so um, I, I spent most of my time working for the Open University. I would go out once a week to Milton Keynes, hitching from Oxford to Milton Keynes. Um, until I got to know people there who would give me a lift each way, because I don't drive, never have learned to drive. Um, so I carried on living in Oxford, and then I got my job here in Bristol at the beginning of 1981, or was it 80? Anyway, beginning of something. And then I moved here. Uh, and, um, and when I came here, as I say, my colleague in, in, in this area, I was appointed lecturer in the philosophy of religion. So to teach philosophy, really. Um, but they recognised that I was, as a matter of fact, in Buddhist studies. And my colleague here in the area was, uh, was Steve Collins. And so we then eventually developed the first Centre for Buddhist Studies here. Started teaching the languages. Steve taught Pali. Um, and I didn't teach Sanskrit. I certainly didn't teach Sanskrit. I eventually did start teaching Tibetan, but it wouldn't have been at that time. So Steve would have been the one who'd have been teaching Sanskrit and, so Sanskrit and Pali. And over the years, built up Buddhist studies here in Bristol. Um, it's taken a hell of a long time uh, because, well, you know, universities with a limited amount of money, why would they support Buddhist studies? Mm -hmm. But um, And then Steve, of course, in the late 80s, went off to, to Chicago um, and sadly died last year or a year, year or so, two years, last year or the year before. It was a bit of a shock because um, he was very much my contemporary. I mean, I, he's a, a year younger than me, I think. 
uh, and we were great, you know, we were very close friends when, when we were in Oxford together. Um, and then he, um, and then, then, then Rupert came. Rupert was originally appointed to stand in for Steve while Steve went to North America. And then when Steve s stayed in North America, then, then we appointed Rupert. And the two of us together have, over the years, campaigned for Buddhist studies, got funds for it, um, attracted students, started by getting a centre and also by simply building up libraries because you tend to forget if you're starting Buddhist studies in a place I mean you're lucky in Oxford you've got these fantastic libraries how do you start B before Steve and I were appointed there was no Buddhist studies done in Bristol um, Steve was appointed to replace someone who taught uh, Hinduism so imagine you want to start getting Buddhist studies going we were the first place I think in the country including Oxford that really had two specialists in Buddhist studies because in our day at Oxford, it was, I mean, on the teaching staff, it was Richard Gombrich. Um, Zainer wasn't a specialist in Buddhist studies. Um, Matilau wasn't really a specialist in Buddhist studies. Matilau's replacement as Spalding Chair was, was Alexis, who isn't a specialist in Buddhist studies as such. So we were the first place and we um, got a centre going, but how do we start building up libraries? How do you start to get funds? Well, one of the first things we did was persuade the university to buy up the entire collection of, of Edward Konza. Um, we, we, and we paid a fair amount to it too. We went down to where Konza lived after his death. Uh, he didn't live after his death, where he lived. We went down after his death and uh, got to know his wife and we bought the entire contents of his study. Um, and uh, ship them back here to the to to Bristol. We also uh, got on very well with Mrs. Konza, and uh, she and Edward Konza's brother in Germany funded the Konza Memorial Prize. So we we got a prize going. Um, we when I was with the Open University, one of the things in the two years I was there, I persuaded them to buy me for my own research purposes was the complete um, microfiche of the Tibetan can Tenjo and Kanjo, which is the Choning, I think. Um, so when I left the OU, I said, hey, you're never going to have anyone there who can ever read Tibetan again. Um, can you sell me the complete collection at a knockdown price? So they sold me the complete collection, so I brought that back here. Um, and we just started to build up resources. We then, um, it took a long time, it took ages, I mean decades, before we could actually persuade the university to put up funds to actually then appoint more staff. And that's always been a problem. But we did, we, we eventually got money for, by developing Buddhist studies, by publishing ourselves, by um, 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 succeeding in having Buddhist studies being highlighted in research assessment exercises and things like that, uh, we eventually were able to persuade the university that, yeah, give us another lectureship and we'll do even more. So we were able to get someone in Chinese. I still remember um, being at, over the years, being at a faculty board meeting donkey's years ago, where someone actually said, one of the professors said, of course, we do no Asian studies at the University of Bristol. And I said, wait a minute, hold on. In our department, we are teaching. At that time, this must have been related. We are teaching Chinese, Tibetan, Sanskrit, Pali, Persian, and Arabic. <laughs> At that time, I mean, you know, this was, um, and and they, they they didn't know that we were doing all this uh, stuff. But anyway, we, as I say, we we are, we we got money to appoint a lectureship in East East Asian Buddhism, so Chinese and or Japanese. We appointed, uh, as I mentioned earlier, John Kishnick, who a tremendous appointment. He's now at Stanford, um, a delightful man. Um, we've, you know, that appointment has, and, and, and his successors have been absolutely super um, there to develop that area. Um, and I remember that when we were appointing in that area, we had some very distinguished scholars applying for that post. So gradually, gradually, Bristol got a reputation. Um, and uh, really, that was what what Rupert and I, um, and then and then of course Rita, um, who whose area is again in in but much more in the anthropological side, uh, and so that gave us a, a, a sort of toehold in 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 practical Buddhism in, in practical Buddhism in Buddhist practice in in places like Sri Lanka, um, and then you know the big AHRC uh, research project on. Um, 
uh, death, um, the Buddhist death rites in 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 South Asia, Asia and, and the East Anglia, uh, East Anglia, and East Asia, um, East Anglia. I know Buddhist death rites in in in, in, uh, in, in Essex. Um, um, yeah, but I mean, you know, this was it's, it's not always easy to understand over the years. The 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 the, the, the problems one has in building up this sort of area. You know, you look and you say, oh yeah, they do Buddhist studies in Bristol. Well, yeah, well we didn't. You know, we we built this up, and it still is. And Richard would would share this in Oxford. It's still over the years difficult to keep these things going. You have to, you know, when you have to persuade universities to keep funding areas that they don't think they need to keep funding. Oxford, of course, and it's always been the case compared with someone like Bristol, has the advantage that you can um, appeal to to Japanese donors, to Numata, and things like that to get funding in a way that, um, by and large, we we never we couldn't in Bristol. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, and, and uh, um, we're we're sort of quite proud about the way we've got Buddhist studies. But but then Buddhist studies at Bristol, well, um, it's not the same as Tibetan studies at Bristol. I mean, the Tibetan studies to, is stuff that that you know I I got people coming and doing, eventually doing doctoral work. But by and large, I mean coming because I got in on this reference to someone like Rob Mayer. I mean, they originally they came up and did their first degree here because they'd heard they were Buddhists, they were interested in Buddhism, they'd heard that we were doing a decent first degree with languages, with proper study in Buddhist studies. And other people who did that over the years, I mean, Rob is one who went on and became a, you know, doing university teaching. Um, Andrew Skilton, uh, did, uh, uh, who was then lecturer at Cardiff um, and connected with Kate Crosby. Um, um, and um, the other one is Anthony Tribe, who, who then... Um, both Andrew Skilton and Anthony Tribe, by then subsequently uh, got involved with um, bits of that Buddhist thought book that I did, um, particularly the revised version that Skilton dealt with, and, and Anthony Tribe wrote that very good, I think, chapter on Buddhist Tantra. Um, they they were all undergraduates here, again came as Buddhists because they were interested in Buddhism, um, and in that sense, I suppose, in a way, my own Buddhist allegiance, and Rupert is a meditation teacher, is something that also meant that people were interested in coming here. Um, so I, 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 who then went on and, and taught in, 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 in universities elsewhere. In each case, in the case of Andrew, Anthony and Rob slightly differently, they went and did their doctorate elsewhere. But um, I certainly taught the uh, Abinicio Tibetan for Anthony and Andrew here mm -hmm. because over the years, once we got the, and this was another important thing for us, once we got the MA in Buddhist studies running, we made a point all along saying that it had to have a linguistic component. That was always our, our difference compared with studying Buddhism at, at some other places at that time, where you would study as part of religious studies. We always emphasise that you, you have to have a linguistic component. And so I started teaching Tibetan. When John Kishinik was here, he was teaching Chinese, Buddhist Chinese too. I think Eric Green was too. Um, which I never actually really got around to doing. I would have liked to have done some of that. I did do some, but but I would like to have done their course with them. Um, but yeah, so so um, uh, other than that, I mean, people coming here wanting to do real serious Tibetological doctoral work. I think I w over the years I've really required that they show they've got Tibetan before coming here, um, which which they have had the ones who've done serious stuff with me um because my i've never my own tibetan is is or was i think of all the languages i mean i keep saying i'm not a good linguist but i think my tibetan was pretty decent uh at least um written tibetan um but depends on the nature of the research they wanted to do really um i'll give you an example uh, i had a, one of my students um doctoral students, very interesting lady, very much a mature student, um, who finished two or three, three or four years ago, did a translation of um, one of the works of Hippolyto Desideri. Um, that was fascinating. Um, the one that I think now, subsequently, some um, uh, Tukton Jimpa and others have been working on, but she was working quite independently. Um, and she translated that text. Uh, and her spoken Tibetan was, was very good. And she'd actually she'd, one of, she'd actually studied Tibetan originally with Herbert Gunter of all people in Saskatchewan, but and she came and I did go through the whole of that text with her, line by line, with the Tibetan, because her background was really in 
in spoken Tibetan, but she wasn't really sufficiently familiar with the, the, the Gelukpa style of Desideri. Fascinating text. And I did feel I could do that. I could go through that. Um, a fascinating text because sometimes Desideri is using Tibetan, which seemed very peculiar. You didn't know whether it was because Desideri was thinking in Latin <laughs> or whether Desideri's Tibetan wasn't very good sometimes or whether, you know, it was what they were saying and you know, it was the style he'd been taught or whatever. You know, he was in real, threw up some real problems. In, in, in Imagine reading a 17th century work by a Christian missionary um, from Italy written in, in, in Tibetan by someone writing in Tibet from, who'd studied in, in Gelukpa monasteries. Absolutely astonishing exercise, and I did. So I did go through that, yeah. Um, but um, I couldn't, put, couldn't do it now. I don't think. But I, I, I did. I did then. But I was very, very um, careful about the sorts. I, I wouldn't supervise people. I felt I couldn't really, um, or couldn't really contribute something useful to. So I, I so um, yeah. Anyway, that's a little bit on the background here in Bristol. Um, I mean, and and it will be the same. Of course, Rupert's a superb linguist in par and superbly good in Parliament. Mean, he's a president of the Parley Tech Society after all, and he he's had. And we've had quite a number over the years of, of, of monks and nuns doing their their doctorates here with us. Um, some Chinese with me, um, um, mainly Theravadins with Rupert. And Rita, um, yeah. What did you enjoy about teaching? Uh, <laughs> I, I'm tempted to say having people having a captive audience and being able to speak at them for hours and hours and hours. But no, what did I enjoy about teaching? Um, it's it's a tricky one in a way. You, to be a university teacher, you have to be a bit of an actor or an actress. You have to be able to be. To be able to stand up and, and actually I wasn't always terribly good at it um, but but once I get going but I also over the years um, I enjoy and I'm going to do this one too I enjoy conveying enthusiasm for the subject for ideas I also very much enjoy this is my look my, my Marjamika I enjoy um, undermining people's um, presuppositions I like I like telling people actually it's not like that or it's much more complex than that. I like getting people to think, uh, to, to appreciate complexity. But in the last analysis with students, with actual students, there are two types of students uh, in my experience. There are students who are really keen and interested and interesting. Um, and there are those who are doing it largely because, well, you know, I've got to do a degree, haven't I? Really? I've got to, you know, I might earn some money in the end. Um, I'll put those to one side. The first group, I love students. <laughs> I just absolutely love students. I love getting people excited about things that excite me, or excited me. I like the people. I like people in, in that sense. I like people who can get excited about things. Um, and I suppose slightly in parentheses, but one of the things, I mean, <laughs> the academic life, at least in this country, is a strange thing. It's one of the very few professions, I'm telling you this now, <laughs> that if you get into and you're really good at, you actually um, end up in a profession where they don't want you for what you are good at. By which I mean, the more senior you become, the more time you spend doing admin <laughs> and running research projects and the less time you do what you were originally employed to do. Um, and um, I, the reason why I say that is that by the end of my time, and I took early retirement um, uh, at the age of 60, but by the end, I was involved quite a lot with basically running departments. Mm -hmm. And my final year, I was actually running um, a, a, a crazy entity uh, because the university, in its wisdom, completely out of the blue, without any sort of prior knowledge, announced one afternoon that they were going to combine the department of what was then called Theology and Religious Studies with the Department of Classics and Ancient History. And I was the first head of this. Um, so I was head of a, a, a mega entity running. It's made out of Classics and Ancient History and Theology and Religious Studies. Incidentally, what do you call this entity? Um, we had to come up with a name for it. We were told the name had to consist of no more than four words because we had to have an acronym of four letters and only four letters would fit in the 
in the university's computing system. So it got called CART. I was the Carter in chief of CART. Um, classics, ancient history, religion, and theology. Uh, and I spent my time doing that for the last few years. Now, okay, right, but the reason, why did I say that? The reason why I said that is because the other thing I got really interested in, in my final time at the university, was, was working, as, working, was counselling, was actually working with students who, off the record, would come and just want to talk about issues and problems. Um, in other words, I was already beginning to move away from Majamaka towards uh, Karuna, <laughs> towards being of use, being of benefit. And that's really what I've taken up since, since retiring. Um, I now spend a lot of time working in one way or another, helping people who've got problems. Um, and I still spend time, and I was a couple of days ago, uh, all night on the streets, um, helping people who are in problems. You've got heaven in Oxford too as a street pastor. And I originally got involved with that because most of the people that I'm dealing with, I'm sad, sad to say in a way, but in another way, totally understandable. The people I, who I'm helping on the streets who are two o'clock in the morning are unwell and vulnerable are students. <laughs> um, and uh, in that sense, I still now spend my time caring for students. And uh, yeah, I like students. I like people. I like, you know, I, I, I you know, um, but I have to say, having said that, going back on what I just said earlier, I'm a little bit impatient with students who aren't particularly interested in what I'm interested, what I'm talking about, you know, what I'm interested in. Um, I, I find that, I, and I did find over the years that my style would be one that would only work as a teacher if people were able to pick up enthusiasm. And if people are resistant to picking up enthusiasm, I do lose patience um, quite a bit. Um, and maybe, maybe that's it. I mean, after, after 30 years teaching at the University of Bristol, and I mean, I've been in academia, in universities. I'm still a full member of the university as an emeritus professor. I've been in academia now for well over 50 years. Um, university academia. Um, well, you reach a point where... Perhaps in your own subject, I'm talking about me now, uh, not necessarily others. Difficult to believe, I know, for, for young folk, but somewhere along the line, the enthusiasm starts to maybe not be there quite anymore. <laughs> you know, yet another year of teaching Mahayana Buddhism to second year undergraduates. You know, next, yet another year of waving my book at them and trying to get them to read the thing. Uh, you know, some of them would, and that'd be great. But a lot of them wouldn't, and that wouldn't be so good. <laughs> yeah. Why did this all happen at Bristol? Pure coincidence. Pure coincidence that Bristol happened at that time to appoint two of us, me and Steve. Uh, and also, to be fair, Bristol then... Um, I mean, sometimes I do get annoyed with the university nowadays, but that it, it, it has been very good to us. It was very good to us, both in terms of our subject and also in terms of a certain indulgent, almost, um, support for the people we are. You know, me and Rupert over the years. I, I think universities nowadays, British universities, are much more de demanding, exhausting, and in a way they're less accepting of eccentricities, of which Buddhist studies itself will be an eccentricity. Mm -hmm. um, but over the years... You know, I would find people in the in the arts faculty, for example, saying, oh, well, of course, yes, we have Buddhist studies, you know, as if it's something very sort of exotic. Um, uh, and, and, and sometimes if you knew how to, that would help get support for it. Um, slightly, again, in, in, in brackets, um, which I often do speak in brackets. But, of course, when I, as, a, as the... Um, was I a professor then? I probably was just about professor. And as far as the rest of the university is concerned, I was professor in Buddhist studies. So that's not my title. It's actually Indian and Tibetan philosophy. And I'm, I wanted it to be that title. I wanted, But at the time, it, it was sort of, there were whispers in corridors when they heard I'd become a Catholic. Somehow, you know, you have to imagine people are not in the discipline. You know, people, they say, oh, yes, well, they, they will do Buddhist studies over there. That's OK. And the people said, well, the professor of Buddhist studies has become a Catholic. And someone was heard to say, you could understand it if it was the other way round. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I thought that was quite, quite interesting. But, uh, they, yeah, so, uh, 
but but yeah, the university has been very good to us, and of course it's a great, it's a great, it's a. I mean, I keep saying what a tremendous city Bristol is, but the university is a, is a great university. It's one of the great Russell Group universities. It's a very exciting university, and it's a tremendous city to have been part of. Um, you know, I'm not, as I've said, I'm not. I'm not. Well, I'm still. I remain remain a member of the university for life, but I'm not any more particularly involved with it at all. Although my my son is, um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a, been a great place, a really a great place to be, and I recommend to any of your viewers <laughs> that if they ever want to live in a great city, Bristol is a great city. And what's more, given my work as a as a street pastor on the streets at night, if you're living in Bristol, even if you're out clubbing at night and you get really ill, I'll be there to look after you. <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes meet people actually. Sometimes when I'm out, because you know, out, out, out as a street pastor, you meet people and they come up and they sort of shake hands with lots of high fives and lots of great things. And then uh, sometimes they will actually say, uh, I've had people say to me, of course, we like Buddhism. Buddhism is the religion that we, we think is the best religion. And I've, I've had to say to myself, just don't go there, okay? I just don't get me to talk about Buddhism <laughs> on, the, on the streets at night when, uh, you know, with the mayhem around the clubbing areas. Um, my, daughter is a, my, my daughter was brought up as a Buddhist. She, in her teens, she would go to parties and she'd meet people, and, and Tara was, I mean, she used to go to the centre with me and so on, but I was completely as a Buddhist, and she would meet people at parties, and they would say to her, apparently, oh yes, Buddhism, we, we really like Buddhism, and Tara would say, oh, Buddhism, really? Well, of course, I was brought up a Buddhist, you know, which particular school of Buddhism are you interested in? Uh, by which time, of course, they wandered off somewhere else. Um, but yeah, yeah, uh, slightly off, that's all off the subject, which is what I do. You established a Buddhist centre here as well. You mean a practicing Buddhist centre? Yes, indeed, and I was very involved with that because when we, um, um, I took refuge with Geshe Damcha. Geshe Damcha La was the um, the spiritual director of the Lamrim Buddhist Centre, which is on the Welsh borders. Um, still there, he Geshe Damcha died uh, two or three years ago, um, so I'm not quite sure what's going on there now, but it's still there. And when I um, came to Bristol which was two years after I'd originally taken refuge, I found myself in Bristol doing what I do, um, which happened to be fairly close to where the Lamrian Centre was. I wasn't no longer actually connected with Geshe as such, but I happened now to have been somewhere here. And when I very first came to Bristol, I, I, I got a little bit interested in, well, I got interested in what the Buddhist scene was here in Bristol. There was quite a lot going on at different times. Um, and there was already Tibetan um, uh, practice of the Sakya tradition here um, under, um, what is his name, Nakpa Jampataye, I think, uh, who's a Westerner who who was a, who does practice Kagyupa stroke Sakya, and there's a Sakya centre here. Um, and I took a little look at that, but I decided, no, this isn't really me because I'm like Galukpa. And I thought, well, the thing to do is to um, get in touch with Geshe Damcha and to see if we can find establish a, a, a group here in Bristol and, and uh, invite him over once a month. And that's what we did. We, we um, um, I, I can't remember exactly how, but obviously I made contact with others who were interested. And we started, and we started meeting in, a, in um, someone's apartment and Geshe would come and teach. And then we would go over there for weekend retreats. And then eventually we actually raised enough money to buy quite a big building here, um, very close to here. Um, which we turned into a, um, a, a, a natural health centre on two, well, on the ground floor and then on part of the first floor, and also a big hall which was tailored, designed for Tai Chi, and then the top floor became a Buddhist centre, and that's the Lamrim Bristol Buddhist Centre. And I remember I was in, I was very involved with that because I even did some of the work, and I'm not this isn't something I do, but I I remember. And we did all the people connected with the group did all the all the, uh, the the building work, and I remember helping smash up some of the drains and things like that. I think I even cut my foot on a piece of ceramic, uh, and and the centre is still there. I mean, I haven't been there since I since year two thousand, but um, it's still there. And um, uh, in a way, it's a sort of sad in a way because it's a sign of my losing contact with a lot of that over the years. It was only when I happened to walk past it a couple of years back and happened to see that they had outside a newsletter that I saw that Geshe had died. I, I didn't know, no one even told me. 
if he'd die. Um, until I saw that. But yeah, so yes, yeah, so I was involved in setting up that centre. Um, I think I probably chaired it or something. And I was also trustee of the Lamrim Centre in Wales, along with um, several other interesting people. Um, John Peacock is, is one who's a, a, a Dharma teacher now, quite a bit. Very, very nice chap. And a chap called John Crook, who was a Zen teacher. The three of us were the trustees of Lamrim, Wales, with Geshula. Um, for, for quite a long time. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and since um, over the years, there's also been another, there was another Gelukpa Geshe, I think, who was living in Bristol at some time, connected with the centre there, but that, I think that was after, after my time. Um, but yeah, so I was very involved with, 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 the, with the Dharma teaching here, and um, I used to teach both at Lamrim, Wales, and at uh, here in Bristol, a weekend retreat sometimes. I, I seem to remember getting people meditating through. I, seem to, I do seem to remember getting people taking long photographs of themselves at different ages in order to contemplate how we change as we get older. And I also remember a lot of stuff about death. Uh, and my, I think one of the last retreats I taught was on, on Majamaka, was on emptiness. And whether there might not be a problem in the Madhyamaka approach. <laughs> that was probably the last one I did. Anyway, that was, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's why I was very involved with that. And involved with, with other Dharma things in the, in the country, really. Um, I, several committees and things I was on over the years. I originally was invited to join, not just because I was an academic, but because I was a, I could represent Buddhism. And notably the Shat Working Party in World Religions and Education, which I subsequently, which is a national working part that promotes the study of religions. Um, and I think I was, Richard, Richard Gomrich was on that. And I think he, I think I was originally invited through him, partly because I was a Buddhist. Um, they wanted Buddhist input there. Um, and various other things like that over the years. Um, so yeah, but yeah, I'm now a Dominican. <laughs> Yeah, that's a different sort of strand in a way to my my background, um, but then I'm I'm sort of holistic on this. I mean, you know, my if in as much as I've been involved in the subject in the discipline, it's it's a it's it's a package in a way. I mean, it's, it's I've been involved all in all these different levels, um, and in a way, the thing that has driven me most, I think, is something which I think academic, I think. You know, those who are doing doctorates and those who are teaching universities is the very thing that most people don't really open up on. And that is that, um, yeah, a, a, a real um, involvement with discovering with my own personal story, in a way. Um, and I suppose in a way one might say, I mean, I'm thinking out loud here and I, I do think out loud a lot. I mean, one might say in a way I, I, I stopped being an academic when I got what I wanted. Um, yeah, I think that's, that, that, that makes sense. And then I went off and do other things that I um, felt was the next stage of that uh, story, in a way. Yeah, yeah, I think I would say that, yeah. And so all those books and things that I wrote were, in a way, well, no, they were, I mean, they were, they were products of that time. Uh, I won't go back into a third edition of Mahayana Buddhism, I'm glad to say. I did at one point start making notes and references and so on um, for, for a third edition, but it will never, I will never do it. Have the Buddhist studies here somehow influenced, you th what do you think, they have Buddhist studies in general? You mean in nationally and internationally, Buddhist studies here? I suppose so. I don't know if I'm the right person to ask. I mean, we've done in Bristol what we've done. I, other people can perhaps say that. I mean, I do sometimes meet people who say, oh, yes, Bristol, yes, you've done stuff there. And so they're the ones who are being influenced. I don't know. We've done what we've done. Um, and again, I suppose there again, I could point to the people like Rob Mayer, like, like, like Andrew Skilton and Anthony Tribe and so on, who I happen to know, uh, not to mention the monks and nuns who we've had here. Um, um, 
particularly working with Rupert, who are now teaching at universities around the, around the world. I mean, Rupert, I know, has been, I think, and certainly keeps in good contact with um, his Taiwanese students. One of my um, doctoral students, my first Chinese doctoral student, teaches, I think, at quite a high level in Singapore. I mean, I assume that these things have all had influence. Um, the academic work that we've done, Rupert, in, in particularly in Abhidharma, Abhidhamma in his case, um, and I suppose the stuff I've done, I leave, other people would tell me whether any of that's had any great value. I mean, I, I do I do sort of like to think that sometimes that my the work I've done um, has had some sort of influence. I think the Mahayana Buddhism book has, has had some sort of influence. Um, funnily, although funnily enough, I mean, that's the book that I wrote. Um, I mean, that's a, a, in a way is a teaching book. It's not actually my research. Um, whether my, my research on I sometimes joke that my book, The Reflexive Nature of Awareness, not only has the most boring title of any book ever written, but probably has the most boring contents of any book ever written. Um, and I occasionally meet people who, 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 who uh, do say they've, they've glanced at it, but I rarely meet anyone who's actually read it. Um, so possibly, you know, my academic work hasn't had much influence, and if it has, it's superseded. But the, the Mahayana Buddhism book does seem to, because it seems that there was a a need for that sort of book, really, as a teaching volume. No one else has been stupid enough to have ever go at writing it. Um, funnily enough, on that book, I was originally asked to write it. It was it was due to be written by Edward Conzer, but he died. So I am the the, the zombie of Edward Conzer. The, 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 I wouldn't claim, want to claim to be the reincarnation of Edward Conzer, I have to say. But um, anyway, the, the book, the eventual book that I wrote, is uh, very different from the one he would have written. I'd imagine. Were you also involved with the Association for Buddhist Studies in the UK in some way? Um, yes. Uh, the, well, the, the, the UK Association of Buddhist Studies, I was the chair of at one time. I was, in, I was involved with the people who set it up, um, people like um, um, Peter Harvey um, and, and um, um, Ian Harris, who sadly died, and people like that. And at some point along the line, they made me the chair. I then, I think I resigned as chair. It might have been when I retired, because I resigned a lot of things when I retired. Um, so yes, I was. And the International Association of Buddhist Studies, I was also involved with um, over the years. I mean, I, I um, in more recent decades, I've really stopped going to international conferences. Um, I was involved with other things, but certainly in the early years, I, I was very involved with that. Um, with with conferences, I remember the Mexico City conference, um, uh, fascinating, and um, with Madhyamaka uh, uh, in and, and and things there. And at one time, I seem to remember I was the European secretary or advisor for the IBS, um, something like that. I forget. I, uh, but yeah, so I, so I was, and I used to, and I met a lot of the academics in the field over the years at that. Uh, Conference. I used to find it, it's, again, it's slightly in parentheses, but I do remember that, because uh, I just mentioned the Mahayana Buddhism book, and you, know, you asked me had anyone had any of the stuff I'd done or, or here in Bristol had influence. Um, I, I used to, um, I still remember meeting at conferences, uh, young scholars in particular, who the moment I met them, the first thing they would ask me was, how much money do you make on that Mahayana Buddhism? <laughs> <laughs> to which I have to answer, not much. Right? <laughs> um, though when the, when the first, first edition came out, it did make make enough per year for Sharon and, 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 and I to uh, um, have a, a weekend away somewhere on, 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 on the royalties. Um, our first trip to Bruges, I think, was on Mahayana Buddhism. But, uh, but yes, no, it never made, very, never made very much, or doesn't make very much. But that would be what they would ask me. So They weren't interested in my, my, my drama career at all. Um, and incidentally, slightly, I mean, in terms of Tibetan studies, and I know that neither of you are working in Majamaka philosophy. Um, I mean, that this is this actually does reflect the changes in in Tibetan studies, um, and and of course Michael would have been delighted uh, the way in which now across the whole discipline. I mean, those of us who got into it originally, and a lot of Tibetan studies through uh, an interest in 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 very 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 um, specialised and ethereal areas of, of philosophy. That's no longer really where things are at in, 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 in the contemporary scene in terms of Tibetan studies. And I'm delighted to, and even in, and in Buddhist studies too, um, you know, when I came into it, people like me, and I suppose you know, people like me came into it 
um, because we were interested in what, in Buddhist terms, would have been the interest, or is the interest, of a very, very minute group of specialists. And in the Western world, very often, that's how Buddhism was, was presented. And one of the great developments in Buddhist studies and therefore and in Tibetan studies in the last 20 or 30 years has precisely been the, the undermining of that model for approaching Buddhism. And people like Richard Gombrich has been very influential there. You know, actually recognising that Buddhism is not Buddhist philosophy. Buddhism is not meditation all the time, you know. Um, and, and I'm glad to say now that, um, in a way, that those of us who who worked on the sorts of things that I've worked on over the years, at least in terms of specialist textual work, are probably in terms of Tibetan studies terms, and certainly in Buddhist studies terms, are now um, becoming the minority that they ought to be, um, really, in a way. And, and I think that's also reflected in Tibetan international Tibetan conferences, and you know, that is absolutely great. And it's enabled me, certainly in the second edition of Mahayana Buddhism, I was beginning to reflect that more. I think, with much more reference to what Buddhists actually do. Um, and I do remember being very influenced by criticisms of the first edition by, um, oh, his name escapes me now, but he's a very good good uh, writer on Nepalese Buddhism and how I made no reference to anything Nepalese in the first edition um, and how very important Nepal was for the understanding of the actual practice of a lot of Mahayana. And I started looking at Nepalese Buddhism and yeah, absolutely. But it, 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 I'd missed all that because I was too busy you know, thinking about about ideas, about about you know philosophical ideas, um, but but one of the great things in the study of of, of, of Mahayana certainly uh, nowadays is beginning to contextualise it all in terms of of of, of um, where ideas fit in terms of pra actual practice, um, and that's 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 great. You know, but then I leave it to other scholars to do all of that. Um, the other thing one learns as an academic. <laughs> as one gets older. When I first came in, uh, all those years ago in Oxford, I say this to you now, I thought, great, I'm going to change the world. You know, I've got all these ideas. Everyone's going to say, this is fantastic. You know, the discipline up till now has been nothing. It's now all been changed by, you know, this uh, a Copernican shift of what Williams has got to say about, about Madhyamaka. Uh, no, it doesn't happen like that. Uh, and you do what you do. One does what one does. Um, and then 20 or 30 years down the line, other people start doing things that are going way beyond what you did uh, and way beyond what you said and sometimes they're highly critical of what you said. And I think for me also, and this links with other things, is the question of letting all that go. I think there's nothing sadder than very elderly academics who are still trying to defend something they wrote 30 years ago when the, the, the discipline has, has gone on. I've seen, I, can't, I won't give you an example in Buddhist study of the studies, but I've seen it in philosophy. You know, where someone made their name in a particular area of philosophy and you know, 30 years later it's, no one's interested in that or it's been completely refuted and they're still busy trying to defend it. Um, there's nothing sadder than that. I think well, as an academic we have to realise that we do what we do and we do when we do it but that um, with very few exceptions there are some people who have created, I'm not talking about our subject but just intellectual in general, there are people who've created whole Copernican shifts, you know the whole discipline has changed because of what they did but, um, and I'd love to think that you might be the very ones, but I, I wasn't, I didn't. Um, and, and one just lets go of that and says, yeah, that's, that's that. That was then, this is now. What can I do now? Or what am I doing now that's got uh, meaning and value? Um, and in spite of all my enthusiasm over the years for, for my Jamaka and indeed for Yogacara and, and, and all the other stuff and so on, um, one reaches a point where I think, yeah, time to do this. I remember actually with Geshe Damchala at one point, I remember talking to him, because I used to talk to him about the uh, you know, debate points and philosophy, and he said to me at one point, he looked, and he said, yeah, I did all that when I was young. Forgotten it all now. And that was the end of it. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's wisdom. <laughs> Could you say something about the beginnings of the two associations for Buddhist studies? They began approximately at the same time yeah. as the Association for Tibetan Studies. Yeah, and I would like to ever say something, but I don't think I can. Not because I, 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 I won't, but I don't. I actually don't think I can. I can't remember. And I also don't think I was involved personally in those beginnings. Um, now, um, let's just think about the Tibetan Studies. 
Um, first of all, I, I mentioned earlier, I've always been, in a sense, out on the wing. I've always been a bit of an outsider and not fitting in directly into what's going on. And I actually, I like that. But I, it was the whole thing about the International Association of Tibetan Studies only makes sense if you think about Tibetan studies. And Tibetan studies wasn't there in Oxford until Michael Harris came. So it was Michael. And people I got to know through Michael, like Per Kverner, um, and um, several other people whose names I've, I've forgotten, but who I, I, I knew, you know, and as I say, some of the Eastern Europeans, like Komash and, and, and um, uh, Geza Betlen Falvi, <laughs> and, and people like that, who I got to know through people like Michael, because they are they are Tibetologists and, and great ones, um, and some of the French, and, and people like Francoise Pomeray, absolutely delightful, and, and then Imaida, Yoshiro Imaida, and all people like that. Um, I got to know because I knew Michael, and Michael was involved with these people, and therefore I got involved. Um, another thing really would be Tibetan studies in this country. Remember that I, I said there was nothing in Oxford, but when I got involved, there was Tibetan studies done in this country. There was David Snellgrove. Uh, who I knew a little bit, although he retired. And then there was also, of course, Philip Denwood, and then Skorupski, who was Snowgrove's pupil. Now, Denwood, um, I, mean, I seem to remember, didn't really get involved with these things, um, nor particularly Skorupski, but I remember the early uh, International Association of Tibetan Studies, the 1970, whenever it was. Um, Snowgrove was there. Because he he said a few things. Incidentally, other people who were there who who would know by name but who've died now would be Tara Wiley, for example, who was a delightful man. Um, and he, I remember, he heard my paper. And there I was, you know, all of twenty whatever, giving this paper. It might, might have been one on Mika Dorji or something boring. Anyway, terribly tedious because I had the idea in those days that the best way to be to give a to give a, a, a conference paper, don't copy me in this, um, was to be like a rock band. You know, the best rock bands are ones that aren't tuning up. They go straight in with a crash <laughs> and a really sort of boom like that. And I thought, so the best way of being a, giving an academic paper is to go straight in with something like, you know, according to Mika Dorje, the, the emptiness is, is, the, is the, the, the opposite of the reflexive of the... And everyone's looking at it completely blank. But anyway, I remember Tara Wiley coming up to me afterwards and, and being so encouraging. He was just so nice. He said that was really, really appreciate. It's really good, you know. Basically, saying you've got a great future in something. <laughs> I don't, don't know what, but but no, he was, and he, yeah, he died quite young too. I think I think he was. He was I was going to say he was quite elderly then, but he was probably younger than I am now. But he he was again. I mean, and that's in, again generally in, as, in terms of being. I mean, senior academics, those who are really encouraging. I mean, you must know this. They're just so encouraging <laughs> really and and who really help and 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 you know, i have to say richard's very good at this richard has always been just so so good with his students so helpful so promoting um he writes wonderful reference letters and i remember once saying to him um that thanking him for yet another tremendous reference. And he said, well, yes, you know, all those years of studying Cicero has its benefits. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, yep, that is absolutely right. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, but, but no, other than that, I can't. And in terms of the origins of the International Association of Buddhist Studies, gosh, um, I can't. I can't. I was not myself directly involved in these things. Well, if I was, I'd forgotten it all or repressed it all. Um, I have a feeling the, the International Association of Buddhist Studies, was it North Americans? Or well, was it that North Americans and, um, subsequently became more involved with it? I, I honestly don't know. All I know at that time, and we're talking about my 20s largely, was that there were conferences and I went to those and gave papers. Uh, and I also went to them and was highly argumentative about other people's papers, which is what one does. And I met some very nice people. Uh, and I, I, you know, I, I met some encouraging people. I also got to know at some of those conferences people who, to the present day, I very much like uh, and, and felt very much um, 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 had a certain sort of affinity with. Notably Tom Tillemans. 
Uh, but I still remember the Tibetan conferences because in those days, the Tibetan conferences, there were very few of us who were actually really working in, do in, in doctrine. You would have, you know, you'd have people there talking about rituals and people talk about art and people talk about music, uh, medicine quite a bit. But there was just, I still remember now, it would be, there would be pretty well me, Tom Tillemans, Michael Broido, and uh, quite often Ernst Steinkellner. <laughs> Although he's slightly different because he was more interested in logic than Mondiomica. He's a delightful man. Um, and, and Rueg. And uh, maybe one or two but basically, and we would form a little clique in the corner where we would, we would speak high Mondiomica at each other. Uh, and it was great fun. Um, and um, all people who I haven't seen for a long time, but very much um, um, learnt from and admire, um, and all much better scholars than I, I've ever been. Um, but but yeah, that that was that was good fun. And as I said earlier, the sun was always shining. Uh, but I don't actually remember myself being particularly involved. I don't remember being. I think I remember chairing some sessions. I don't ever remember being on any committees. I suspect in those days, even then, I felt a bit of an outsider. Uh, and even then, certainly in those days, and this would have been before, I'm still thinking about the 70s, so um, I would have, I didn't finish my doctorate till towards the end of the 70s. I probably, it wouldn't have probably crossed my mind in those days that there was anything particularly to be, no, I don't say to be gay, that sounds selfish, but um, there wasn't any, I didn't have any particular need to be on committees. Nowadays, if I was a young scholar wanting to make my name in the field, I would be busy, you know, getting on all kinds of committees. Um, but in those days, she didn't have to do that. So I got plenty later. I think I was very obsessive. I am obsessive. I was very obsessive on my, my own work. Um, and I would read and read and read and, and, and research and research and research and go off on tangents and all kinds of, I mean, I read up on so many different philosophers who I think might be useful for the study of Mardianica. All kinds of philosophers, even in philosophical circles, no one's ever heard of. Fritz Mountner was one, I remember. He gets mentioned once in Wittgenstein. He was a, um, a, a Viennese, turn of the century, uh, Fritz Mountner, who said something interesting about language, and I can't remember what it was now. And I thought, right, got to read a whole lot of Fritz Mountner. You never know, he might be useful in, in my job. I think somewhere in my thesis I mentioned Fritz Mountner. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a favourite philosopher? Favourite Western philosopher? Any. Oh, a favourite philosopher, full stop. Philosopher, philosopher. Oh, I don't know. I do remember, actually, when I was being interviewed for my job here, saying, and I still think that there's a lot of truth in this, that if I had to be on a desert island with only one book by a philosopher, it would have to be the complete works of Plato. Um, although in some ways nowadays, I'm, uh, uh, it would be Aristotle, but no, but I still think, the, 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 um, but if you ask me, I suppose, I suppose I would have to, but you know, with a different hat, um, um, it, uh, my favourite philosopher in the sense of richness and one I keep coming back to. Well, all of these books are Aquinas. So it'd have to be Aquinas, wouldn't it? And as a Dominican, and I would describe myself largely nowadays, intellectually as a Thomist. Uh, I quite often on things that I tend to talk about nowadays, which tend to be um, aspects of philosophical theology. Um, I'm, I'm approaching it from the point of view of Aquinas. And funnily enough, one of my less known publications um, is a, 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 a um, an article I did, which is in it's in a book and it's also in a journal on what would Aquinas have made of Buddhism if he'd known about it. Uh, <laughs> um, and there I'm referring to I'm using some Tibetan stuff on I think some Bodhicharavatara stuff, particularly what would Aquinas have said about Shanti Deva's um, treatment of God, for example. Quite interesting. Of course, he didn't know. But uh, had he, I think I can say what he would have said. <laughs> so yeah, it would have to be Aquinas, I suppose. But 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 Plato, yeah. I mean, if you really had to be on a desert island, Plato. Plato was the was the. I didn't say earlier, but Plato was my, the first philosopher I really ever read. I just thought it was absolutely. It, it partly it took. It, I say it, it, it partly among the things I loved about Plato was not just what he was saying, but was was the whole. Coming back to what I said earlier, the whole um, way, the Socratic way of undermining people's pretensions and presuppositions. Um, it's dangerous stuff, that. Uh, dangerous stuff for young people. 
you can very easily nowadays, I think, get too caught up in arguing with people for the sake of it, which is what I used to do, I think. Not listening enough. I try to listen nowadays, which I'm not very good at. <laughs> How do you remember the first IELTS meeting? The first, IELTS. oh, the Tibetan studies. Mm. Was that the one in Oxford? Yeah, um, yeah the, the conference in Oxford. Funnily enough, given my memory, I do have memories of it. I can't remember much about my memories. No, I mean, I do remember being there. I remember the uh, the um, the guy who was the the, the, Pern, the head of the Pernbo at that time. Um, someone who worked with, of course, you know, there was quite a lot of Pern um, in, input because of the influence of people like Peck Werner and, and Snellgrove. And the chap who was the, I forget his name now, but the chap who was the, the, the Pern... Um, um, uh, leader there it was one who'd worked with Snowgrove I think um, and I remember them there I as I said I mentioned Tara Wiley and giving a, a paper and you mentioned earlier you got the, the photograph taken at that conference and I vaguely now recollect going in the gardens for the photograph um, I seem to remember Stein coming up um, but I can't honestly remember that much more I wasn't as I say I wasn't involved in the setting of it up the papers at that conference Will have been the ones I suppose that was were in that volume that Michael Michael Aris and uh, and Sue edited, wasn't it? And the one that's published by Aris and Phillips. So I suppose, uh, um, and if I look back at that volume, it's probably not one of the books I've now got actually, but that would remind me of what what the items were and the people who were there. I mean, it would have been people I mentioned earlier. Um, also remind me of what it was I spoke about actually. Um, can't for the life of me remember remember what it was. Was it was that the one on um Song of Power and the Two Trues? I don't know. Um but but yeah I can't honestly remember much more. I went to the subsequent conference in the Visegrad. Um and again it's similarly, you know, it, it, I thoroughly enjoyed it, I remember. Um and uh actually you know given that you're from the Czech Republic, on on the way flying to Budapest at that time. I remember the airport, the aircraft I was in, must have been landed in the airport in Prague, but it was under the old regime. It was not looking very, very happy over there. But it's, I'm really so, so glad the way that things have developed uh, there. I mean, just and, and going over there myself and, and knowing Yishi is just absolutely tremendous. Um, and I love Prague now, and it's just, it's just very, very, um, you know good things have happened and um, but yeah in those days it was it was still very close and I remember being in Hungary it must have been was it would have been Centenary anyway looking over the river towards Czech, Czechoslovakia and uh, and I think we were all there looking over <laughs> basically in that direction and it it, it, was, it didn't look so so happy at that time but you know things have turned out much better which we could, we didn't we you know we couldn't couldn't imagine that time. But actually, that is a point to to bear in mind. In terms of Tibetan studies, it was through Tibetan studies that I got to know lots of people from 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 Eastern Europe in the old days under the old regimes. Um, even when I first went to Budapest, it was still under the old regime, and got to know lots of lovely lovely people. And it was actually one of the ways by which contact was was opened. And I think we do need to bear that in mind, and we need to bear in mind the way in which, in, which in general, um, academic context, but in this particular case, Tibetan studies, has had um, a, a meaning beyond itself, a, 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 a broadening out in terms of keeping contact, keeping people. I know that um, in the old days, you know, there, in, certainly in philosophy, there were people who were going over to um, to the Czech Republic and all, or to the Czechoslovakia, and also to um, Hungary and and through philosophy were helping to um, do things that led that led to change, and certainly when I was um, in Hungary, which I didn't go at that time to to Czechoslovakia, but I I, I was in Hungary and it was uh, it, and of course you know, Chomer de Kuras and 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 uh, the the uh, Tibetan connection in Hungary was a tremendously important um, and Chomer de Kuras, I mean himself of course is very important to the Hungarians tremendously important way by which. Um, one was was able to 
make contacts and to open up and to yeah do the things that, that needed to be done in those days. And uh, it's only really relatively recently that I thought back and thought, yeah, we were doing something there that was was um, worth it, uh, worth more than just simply Tibetan studies. Um, and I think also, I think some of that's also happened in terms of the opening up of Tibet now, and um, although that I haven't really been involved with that. But I, I suppose my general point there is to always bear in mind that um, academic work is something which can have, but also should have, a meaning beyond itself. Some sort of deeper moral, in the broadest sense of the word, significance or meaning. Could you say more about that? Um, well, um, in a way, I, in a way I'm like not sure I could. <laughs> um, um, in, a, in a way, I mean, I, th I think that we as human beings are alive. When we're, I mean, we have to make our way through life. When we're young, there are certain things that are terribly important. And it includes, you know, one's studies, one's interests. How am I going to make a career? Who am I going to marry or whatever? Um, you know, what is it going to be? But, 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 but um, in the last analysis, those things um, vary in their importance as at different stages in one's life. But in the final analysis, um, they are things which have only a relative importance. Uh, I'm sort of starting to speak like a Marjamika here, but unlike a Marjamika, I actually think that not everything is relative. I think there are certain things which have um, a, a more fundamental importance. I would not argue even things which have absolute fundamental importance, but let's put that to one side. Um, and I do think that um, if one can bear that in mind, then in the more Mm, in, the, in the less metaphysical sense, let's just say, let's just say in the moral sense, asking oneself, why am I actually doing this? How is it being of any, this is Buddhist, you know, how is this being of use to sentient beings? You know, if I, if I do this, how am I actually um, um, going to, going to uh, improve things for people, improve life for people? How am I helping? Um, I think we need to keep asking that. And I think we need to um, keep asking it and ask it more and sometimes less at different stages of our life. Um, I think we need to ask it about our career. And I also think we need to bear in mind that whether or not we do ask it, um, what we're doing has those impacts. Uh, you know, you know the old thing about we're not an island, um, even if Brexiteers think we are. You know, we're, we're not an island. We're not isolated. We're not um, individual monads. You know, we are in, we exist in relationships. This is, this is after all, is totally understandable to my Jamaicans. We, we exist in relationships. What we do has an impact on, 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 on the world. And therefore, even if we ignore the impact of what we're going to do, if, we, if that's not important to us, it is still going to have an impact. So I can now say, as I'm doing, and I'm really thinking this out loud in a way, that my, my involvement with Tibetan studies in those early years, particularly in as much as it was um, drawing on on on, um, on on Poland as well, of course, um, and and Hungary and and Czechoslovakia um, and and that area, um, uh, uh, um, not only led me to meeting um, a large number of absolutely delightful people uh, and making contacts and great scholars too, but also had a wider impact, which I've, 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 I haven't properly myself realised, really. Um, uh, so, so we do need to bear in mind that, that what we're doing has a wider impact. But what I'm also saying is a more positive thing. We need to actually be thinking about how, uh, um, how can what I'm doing, imp or, or how might what I'm doing impact on others in a way which is which is positive. Let's use it that way. And I know that some people will, will think I'm being a sort of a, a moral prig, as they used to say on this. But 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 I do think that things do not exist. Um, there, there's no. I don't. A lot of postmodernism I'm not in sympathy with. But the one thing, I, one of the things I am fairly much in sympathy is is the idea that there is just as there is no such thing as a totally objective, un, uh, contentless fact. So there is no such thing as a totally um, um, uh, 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 anything which which is completely devoid of 
of course, um, Marxists would say political, but I'm inclined more to say to, broad, to say moral, um, in the broadest sense of the word, uh, significance. Um, moral here meaning um, 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 is bound up with, 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 with um, things being better or things being worse. Let's. Say. I'm trying to make it deliberately general, and I'm thinking it out loud as I go along. Actually, I've not really thought about it very much. Um, but I think that's how I feel anyway. That's how I feel now. So, yeah, so by all means, you know, do one's two and studies and, 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 and get one's doctorate and things like that. But um, also have an awareness of the, how is this? Yeah, I mean, I like the Buddhist phrase. How is this going to be a benefit to sentient beings? Um, uh, how is it actually going to be of use? How is this of use to others? Yeah. There, I think the Dalai Lama and I would agree. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I don't really agree on that one. Paul, could you say something about your first travels to India? Well, yes. Um, interestingly enough, uh, um, uh, as I, I, I might have mentioned already, the um, I didn't actually go to India until I was... Uh, I've been studying things Indian for for quite a long time, uh, and indeed, it, one might have al almost think that it would actually visiting the country would uh, would possibly would put one off. But uh, I found it going to India absolutely absorbing, and I learned a great deal from from going to India in terms of simply being there, um, and um, it helped broaden my. Uh, my not just my understanding of Buddhism and, and, and indeed Indian culture and Indian archaeology, uh, but also um, my 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 appreciation not appreciation my understanding of people my empathy for people as well, uh, and I've often said you know that, that a trip like that is is something that everyone should do. I, I first went to India in the late seventies, um, so a very different Indian world from the, from the world today. And uh, that was because I was going with the Open University to make this uh, television film, hour-long television film on Hinduism as practiced in a village. Mm -hmm. Plenty of things you could find on Hinduism, but very little on actual real village Hinduism, actually what goes on in a village. Uh, and we were filming in a village close to Sarnat. Uh, and among the questions we were asking were um, uh, what, the, the villagers made of Sarnath being a Buddhist site fairly close by uh, and particularly we spent quite a lot of time both in in the village we were in and also in in Varanasi itself with some of the uh, very um, um, the the, the uh, castes which are particularly um, uh, I don't know what the expression is nowadays but you know, not not very high caste or indeed uh, um, and we would ask some questions because there has been a move in modern India among uh, low caste, outcast people to uh, convert to Buddhism and also sometimes to convert to Christianity. So these were among the questions that we, sometimes we were asking them. But basically it was how, on how does Hinduism work out in that particular village? You know, what is the, 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 the structure of it? And fascinating it was. And I think the film we made, um, Open University Stroke BBC, is still... Uh, one of the, was well, certainly one of the first, if not the first, in that sort of line, uh, and um, is um, still well worth watching. We were very much helped by some North American graduate students who were living in the area at the time and were um, um, have gone on to great things and who uh, spoke very good. Hindi and uh, sometimes also the local dialect as well so they helped us not my field as an academic really Hinduism in a village but I was the lecturer so I was there to advise I didn't actually have much advice to do but anyway um, but it meant that I got to see the sites I got to see Sarnath I got to meet up with Tibetans in Sarnath I also got to buy quite a number of books while I was there I remember several of my um, early Tibetan texts I got there uh, and I suppose in terms of my story um, that possibly was, again, one of the factors that was coming into play. Remember, this is all just after finishing my doctorate. 
which is, is sort of fast coming into play, that, that sort of moved me towards more and more interest in, in, in Tibet and things Tibetan and, and um, indigenous Tibetan writing. After all, I came back loaded with all these books. And I still remember Gelsap Jay on various things. And, and so I had to do something with them, didn't I, really? <laughs> so start reading them. Zhang Yilek Shinyungbo, I remember, was one of them. So start reading them, because they were all the ones that were published in Sarnat by the, uh, what's it called, the, the Pleasure of Elegance Sayings Printing Press and so on. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I, I, I brought back all of those. I also um, went up to uh, to uh, Kathmandu, to Nepal, for a, a short visit in one of the breaks between filming, and we also went over to Bodh Gaya as well. So, so it was a great trip and uh, made nice friends and um, uh, then, yeah, and, and made a good film, I think. I, as I say, it wasn't really my field, but we had excellent advisors, both in, in India and over here, to make a good film of it. So uh, I still recommend it. Hour-long um, film on Hinduism in the village. Where, <clears throat> where can we see it? Uh, where can you see it? I don't... Nowadays, of course, you can probably Google it. It's called The Wages of Action, Hinduism in a... But at one time, I used to show it to my students here because in the old days you would buy it from the BBC. I'm sure somewhere in Oxford you've got it. Uh, and uh, there are all those people. We filmed an exorcism or two. And uh, um, yeah, anyway, I was behind the camera. Not literally behind the camera, but in the background. Not having to do very much. I remember at one point getting quite frustrated that basically I'd as an advisor, I didn't have any advice to give. Um, not that they were asking me and I didn't have it. They actually weren't interested in any advice I might give. Um, but the, the chap who was the producer, the director or whatever, who was with us, David Thompson, went on to be a, the BBC, to, to become a really quite an important BBC producer, I think. It's very good. Yes, so yes, you can see it. And that's, that's what I was involved with. But And I still, I, I used to use it for teaching and I still think it's... Uh, I suppose at that point, actually, in a way, it, again, it drew my attention to the gap between the sort of things which I'd, because of my interests as a philosopher, which I'd, I'd experienced in the past, which is very to do much to do with um, uh, philosophy and ideas and what is really going on on the ground. Uh, and... Um, the of course that's one of Richard Gombrich's important points in terms of understanding Buddhism in Sri Lanka and what the interplay is between uh, between theory uh, very abstract theory or if or, and possibly no interplay at all and what the bulk of people are doing on the ground of course the old model I mean the old model that was still there when I came into this uh, uh, which we would all totally reject now uh, was that uh, these are these are superstitious peasants who don't really understand their own religion type of thing. Uh, and um, we still get that in Buddhist studies, uh, unfortunately, and just for some reason, possibly because Westerners who are interested in Buddhism are often particularly interested themselves in Buddhist philosophy. We often find that idea, if not consciously, subconsciously smuggling in. You know, Buddhism is all about meditation. Buddhism is all about um, uh, not self, or it's all about... Um, emptiness or whatever. Uh, and of course, the fact that these people don't appear to either know those things or behave according to the way we think they should behave, because after all, that is uh, um, what they're supposed to believe as Buddhists, means that they really don't understand their own religion or they're all benighted peasants or they're all superstitious or whatever. And that's one of the things that comes over quite interestingly in the, um, in, in the very last, one of the very last things I did, which is the Buddhist Funeral Rites Project, because there you've got um, uh, you know, tremendous studies of uh, what Buddhists do in terms of death and funeral. And then you put that alongside some sort of commonly known Buddhist doctrinal positions, and you think, oh, well, 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 they don't seem to cohere. <laughs> but that's giving, what that's giving is not a problem for the Buddhists, it's actually giving a problem for how we're approaching the religion. Um, incidentally, a lot of people will even accept that, but they don't always reverse it and will apply the same thing to Christians. In other words, <laughs> the fact that we find Christians who don't necessarily do what they think Christian theology says they ought to be doing, um, it's not a problem for the Christians, it's a problem for the model you're adopting. Anyway, that's another story. Sorry, I, I so that was my first visit to India, anyway, <laughs> um, and that was that was what it for was for for making that film.
It wasn't a research visit. Subsequently, <sighs> I, I went on research visits. And I spent quite a lot of time at the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives. Um, to be honest, in terms of my own research, I didn't need to be. Uh, it wasn't that I went to the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives in order to read a particular text. And it certainly wasn't the case that I went there in order to study with a particular Lama or anything like that. That wasn't... For me, actually, and this is an academic point, for me, there, there is a genuine issue about the, um, the role played by studying classical Tibetan texts with a modern Lama, vis-à-vis -vis the issue of actually what the text meant a thousand years ago, and also what it means in terms of the Tibetan um, um, commentary tradition. It, it, you know, the, the, this was another phase that happened in the history of the study of Tibetan Buddhism um, during my, my lifetime, in a way. Having realised that there were Tibetans there, and that Tibetans studied these texts, and that Tibetans still practised the religion, some people came along and said, well, of course, you have to study the text with the Lama. Well, that doesn't follow. Um, and most of the texts that I've ever actually um, looked at with the Lama, it turns out what the Lama is saying is simply what the school textbooks say of their tradition, often very simplified. So I can easily go and read the school textbooks. Um, but if I do read the school textbooks, I will find that there are various views. There are other traditions are saying different things. And anyway, what the relationship is between the school, let's say a, a school textbook commentary to the Majjhima Kavatara and let's say... Um, I don't know, you know, uh, Songpa's own disciples or Songpa on the same themes is, is, is a very complex issue. Uh, and in a way, funnily enough, in Christianity, in, in, in Catholic theology, it's almost as if um, this, this point has been realised because in, 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 in relatively recent Catholic theology, there's been a whole um, going back to Aquinas. Uh, and realising that reading Aquinas through the eyes of 19th and early 20th century scholastic textbooks is not going to get it. Uh, and if you said to me, oh, but you can't possibly study Aquinas without going and asking your priest down the road, we would say, well, wait a minute, he might not be very learned. And even if he's got a doctorate, uh, you know, did he, did he get it with by reading scholastic textbooks or did he study with some of the very best recent uh, scholars in the field or is he basing it on Aquinas himself or you know and 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 one of the things I want to get over is that is that what is perfectly normal practice quite often in in the study of Christian theology or Christian philosophy or Christian philosophical theology is often completely ignored and forgotten in the study of Buddhism um, it's, as if, it's as if people working in the field of Buddhist studies have to reinvent the wheel sometimes um, one of the things I was doing with some of my own graduate students in recent years was trying to get them to draw on a lot of the resources that we have, for example, in the study of medieval philosophy uh, and using those in, in, in the same methodologies and approaching uh, Buddhist thought. Um, yeah, so that's slightly off, off on a tangent, but, but it, is, it is an interesting point, I think, you know, that we, I, I certainly don't, I certainly don't think, and you might say this is just because of my own background, but I, I certainly don't think that if we want to study a particular area of, of, of Buddhist philosophy, uh, certainly if it's Indian philosophy, albeit like Nagarjuna or, or, or Chandrakirti or whatever, um, and, we, and we're going to look at Tibetan sources on this, I don't think that the first thing we should be doing is uh, in order to study that, if that's what we want to study. Uh, that, that, and it's certainly not obvious to me that we should be going and finding a Lama to teach it to us. Um, quite the reverse. I, I, I am inclined to think, certainly for, for students, that that is probably, unless we're talking about practicing your Tibetan language, but uh, uh, in terms of actually understanding the text, I think that's probably time wasted. Uh, yeah, wasted, not, not in every sense of the word, but, but in, 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 uh, for the understanding of that text, uh, which is after all a historical phenomenon, um, and often texts written a long time ago, uh, time wasted. And you kept returning to India. Uh, yeah, not not as much as many scholars as many people do. Partly because over the years, partly because my um, well, I, I, my own work was textual. Partly because I got very not that much research leave um, over the years. Very involved with other things, involved with the family here uh, and funding and so on. So to, to justify going to India is largely, or living with Tibetans, was largely 
um, simply because it was a good thing to do rather than my own actual research. And, and sometimes that could actually be counterproductive because, for example, if I've got, let's say, a month research leave or two months or three months and I go to India for that time, that's all very nice. But am I as likely at the end of that period to have produced another book on, uh, I don't know, who knows what, you know, Shaka Chopton on, on the Majama Avatar or whatever, um, during that time? And the answer is probably not. Whereas if I sit in Bristol in a library with a whole load of text in front of me, I would be more likely to. So there is that to it. But yes, I did. I, 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 uh, for, I'm just slightly related to that. Funnily enough, the, the, the book I did on, on Meepum um, was I actually started writing indeed when I was abroad, but not in India. I started writing that in Canada when I was in Calgary. And that's because I just started reading Meepum on this. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I started jotting things down and then found it became a book. And that was, that was written in, in, in Canada. Um, but again, it's just sitting down with, and this is actually over the years, the things I actually really enjoyed. I know it's not so popular nowadays, but just having time to sit down with a whole load of texts. You know, you say, you look at this verse and you think, hmm, I wonder what that means. Oh, yes. And then you, you look at the Sanskrit and you say, oh, that's that. And then you look at this commentary and you say, oh, gosh. And that commentary, and then you say, hang on, these commentaries aren't coherent with each other. And then having done all that, you then start to ask questions like, what, well, okay, what looks like being the best interpretation of that text and then what, what do we mean by best anyway best in what sense and then eventually one might reach a stage where you say okay I think I've got the best interpretation of it um does it make any sense you know is this is this a, a rational argument that's the stage that most people don't ever get to but funnily enough as a philosopher that was really the thing I was trying to do <laughs> um you know is this is this a good argument is it going to work uh, um, and I do think in my own history, the history of my studies I've done of Indian um, philosophical texts, Buddhist philosophical texts, I, over the years, I have actually gradually started doing more of that. It's, it's a risky business. It's risky because it's, um, of course, you, you, you can very easily get it wrong. It's also risky because very often with classical texts, I remember the person who said, was it saying it about Plato? It was certainly saying it about something in, in ancient philosophy. He was saying, look, we're not dealing here with arguments that actually work. We're dealing with incredibly stimulating and interesting arguments that fail. Um, and that doesn't always go down. Certainly in my day, because so many people involved in Buddhist studies were had a, an involvement with it, to actually say, well, actually, this argument's not a very good one, is it? Uh, or... Um, uh, you know, I can't make any sense of this argument of Nagarjuna apart from the fact that it's completely fallacious. Uh, or Shanti Devi, as I said in that paper, um, seems to have destroyed the Bodhisattva path. <laughs> that didn't go down very well. Now, that sort of thing doesn't go down very well. But that's actually what I'm trained to do. Um, and the answer to that is not, oh, this is, you know, this is, this is it. It's inviting other people to come back. Uh, and that's how one does it in philosophy. Um, so yeah, so I so I started looking much more much more um, um, critically at what the actual arguments are, and invariably, just as no one nowadays would actually read Plato or indeed Aristotle and say, "Great, that's it, it's the truth, fantastic, I've got it," um, you know, it's unlikely that's going to happen with Nagarjuna or Chandra, certainly not with Nagarjuna or Chandrakirti either. Um, and the fact that there are traditions that do is 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 okay, but you know, one 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 engages with that critically. Um, anyway, that was the approach that I took, really. Um, can't remember how I got onto that, but anyway, it must have related somewhere along your line to. Oh yes, you were asking me um, about yes about several trips to India. Oh, so that was why I didn't actually go to India that much. Um, I I went. Uh, I subsequently, as I say, I went and um, spent some time in in Dharamsala. And again, in terms of simply being in Dharamsala, it was it was fascinating. And I spent quite some time um, with initiations with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, um, and. Um, enjoying the environment and enjoying the culture, um, taking, as one has to, lots of Tibetan medicine, because everyone in every Western in Dharam Sahara is taking Tibetan medicine for something. Um, I was, I was uh, um, um, suitably diagnosed by Dr. Yoshida and, and all that sort of thing. Um, and then the, the other trip I was, um, I was spending at Drepung, um, it, down in the south, down in Karnataka. 
And there I went there with, originally with Geshe Dantra, because he's from Draper and Saling. So I went, I accompanied him back there. And I think probably that would have been, I can't quite remember how many months, but that would have been all the time when he was there as well then. So, and we were tremendously well treated, because of course I was there with, with the Lama from the, the Geshe from the, from Draper and Saling. And it was there that I um, offered to teach English language, give English language practice to, to some of the young monks, which is what I did. I doubt with great success because they didn't seem to... I remember going into the class and saying, OK, now what textbook, do you, textbook are you using? They looked at me completely blankly and they didn't have any textbooks. So, um, and anything I said, they would, uh, I would have to write up on the board and uh, they would simply laugh and that was it really. And there would be lots of people at the window looking in and all laughing as I was teaching. So I don't think they learnt anything from me, but at least that was something I could could contribute. And that was a tremendous experience being there too. And because uh, Drepung, Drepung um, is is close down in Karnataka to, uh, to Gandan as well. Uh, Sarah's further over. But, um, and, and so that was an interesting time. And we were there also when the Dalai Lama visited again. And that was, uh, and in fact, I took, I took a lot of uh, uh, pictures, a lot of slides at the time, which I used to show to my students of my life in, uh, in Drepung culminating in visit by the Dalai Lama uh, and we had a tremendous uh, we were tremendously well treated and, and uh, um, have great memories of great affection of being there yeah how was it coming to the community having worked on Buddhist philosophy and Buddhism oh good question the culture alive um, um, yeah but of course I had been a practitioner with Geshe Damsala um, let me put it this way. One of the people who went with us, I went there with two other of Geshe's students. And one of them, the moment he got there, said he felt like a fish out of water and got struck on an aeroplane and came back home again. Uh, so it was that shock. For me, I was, I'd was i spent so many years studying this stuff. And um, I was also, of course, not just a... You know, I was professionally involved also in Buddhist studies and, and that sort of thing. Um the real life, meeting the real life. I, I, I don't think I can, I, I think all I can say, I mean, living in a, in a Tibetan monastery is, is not the same as day-to-day -day life living in a Tibetan community, lay community or whatever in the mountains. And also a Tibetan monastery, um, which is, is, a, is a refugee community. Um, I think all I can say is I, I, found it, I found it fascinating and very enriching. I didn't have any, any particular um, sort of jarring problems. I, I used to, um, I also had a separate class of, of uh, older young monks, older monks, who would, would, but not old monks, older young monks, who would come and visit me in my room and I would give their English language practice too. Um, no, I enjoyed, I enjoyed it. I, I didn't have any particular problems. I had, I had you know, it was it's a fairly remote part of India and I did have hair raising problems when I finally left, getting back to uh, Delhi. Uh, as I, you know, that was the time when I was on the train that was stoned by rioters uh, all night. Um, but no, I, I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the monastery, and they were people were extremely nice and extremely uh, um, uh, accommodating. And um, yeah, the whole, the whole, and I, and and I still do remember it quite well because I took lots of pictures and showed them. I've showed them over the years to my students. Also. Uh, one of the uh, um, one of the uh, um, very distinguished monks uh, there was a Geshe uh, Pepe Gelson Rinpoche who died. I think he 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 was one of Geshe Dangcha's teachers, and he had actually been to this country to teach. And I attended some of his teachings. And he was from Draper Losling, and he died. Was it when I was there or just after? Anyway, the point is they made a very very good television film subsequently. Um, about the search for Geshe Pema Gelson's reincarnation um, called the reincarnation of Kenzo Rinpoche, I think, which I used to show to my students very regularly. And it was shot by people I knew and overlapped with the time I was there. So it was very much the same people. Um, and that was fascinating. So, yeah, it was a very enriching time, I think. Um, uh, but that was, that was, yeah, that was a long time ago too, really. And I haven't been back to India since then. Uh, and as I say, I've never been in over the border into Tibet. 
uh, I've been. Uh, I, when I was in Dharamsala, there's a Tibetan, a young Tibetan, well, she wouldn't be young now, but she was at the time a, a child, really, who we sponsored for many years from here. Um, when my children were younger, we used to, once a week, we would have a very austere meal in the evening and the money would go to help the t Tibetan, mm -hmm. our Tibetan girl. Um, uh, but, but no, I've never actually been over the border into Tibet. Uh, it's sort of opened up since I was really active in that area. And as I said before, my own research didn't really require it. One of my sons has been, funnily enough, so he's, he's been from the other side. Um, Whether, I mean, uh, certainly much earlier on, when, when Michael uh, Eris was alive and when I was in Oxford, I was uh, quite... I was, I was quite interested in and in, semi-involved in certainly enthusiastic for the Tibetan refugees um, and and their plight. And um, at the time, I used to think probably the Chinese wouldn't like me in any way, but I don't know what the situation was. It would probably be quite different now. Um, there was a time um, later on, not when I was in Oxford, but when I was uh, in Bristol, when I and several other people were invited for a, an evening's entertainment at the Chinese Embassy in London. Um, and that was a propaganda, a whole propaganda session, food, films, the lot. Uh, and I do remember, actually, for some reason they invited me, so they must have had my name on some list. Um, and I do remember that when we came out afterwards, it was, it was one of these things where they, they show lots of pictures of happy Tibetans with great piles of blankets in the background. <laughs> Um, and when we came out, there was actually a protest outside with Tibetans saying, shame, shame. And I went over to them and I said, look, you've got nothing to worry about. No one has been convinced by any of that in there. But what I still interested to uh, reflect is why on earth the Chinese thought I was remotely of any significance for this particular exercise. Um, but obviously they had me on a list somewhere. So anyway. And you mentioned... <clears throat> Michael Eris. Yeah. How do you remember Michael? Oh, with great affection. Anthony dear Harris. man and Anthony. Of course, you know, they're complete twins. Uh, and, well, complete twins. I mean, they are uncannily identical. The number of times, you know, you know we've said hello, Michael, when it's been Anthony. Um, and it's very weird, of course, because, you know, after Michael died, you would, you would see Anthony and it was like having Michael there. Um, and I didn't really, I mean, I, when we were in Oxford, we had a lot of contact with Michael, not Anthony, because he wasn't really based in Oxford, although a little bit of contact through Eris and Phillips through the publishing company. But we had a lot of contact with Michael, who was very much part of our, our circle once he'd arrived, and um, a dear man. As I said earlier, he did rather smoke a lot, um, which nowadays I would find much more difficult. I mean, I, I've never been, I've always been rather anti-smoking, and uh, um, you'd go to his rooms and they'd be just full of smoke, but he was just so sweet and, and so nice, and um, uh, I think I've still got actually somewhere one of, one of the, the books he gave me. He gave me texts as well as, I've got somewhere Kedrup, the Wayman's translation of Kedrupje's of Fundamentals of the Buddhist Tantras, signed inside by Aung San Suu Kyi, which, uh, we, we, which was given to me at that time. But no, he, and, and I, we saw a lot of him. Of course, his field wasn't really mine. It was, it was Bhutanese history. Um, and at that time, um, he was a fellow of St. John's, wealthiest college in Oxford, or at least it was then. Um, and uh, I, I was uh, a graduate student, graduate scholar, uh, and then subsequently, I, I was a fellow of Wadham, but that's, that's a little bit later. So he was sort of, on the other hand, he, he, was, he was older than me, um, finishing his PhD at SOAS, the stuff that came out on, on, on Bhutanese history. Um, but yeah, saw a great deal of him, um, very much, uh, um, what did I say, learned or drew on, on his enthusiasm for Tibet, um, never really absorbed his enthusiasm for Bhutan particularly, but there might have been, it's not for any particular reason, apart from the fact that, 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 that you know, Drupa Kagyu is not, uh, is not exactly Galuk. Um, but still, you know, I just, just got that great enthusiasm from him for things Tibetan. And he really, one way or another, introduced me to an awful lot of, um, I said earlier, to the Tibetan, um, see, the Tibetan study scene. And to people I don't think I would have ever known, got to know a lot of those people, including uh, Peg Vanna, who I, who I like very much and who I've kept in some contact with over the years. Um, a tremendous scholar. 
And um, so, yeah, I learned a lot from Michael. Having said all that, in terms of learning in the sense of what actually did you study with him, well, only the language. You know, um, I don't recall reading any texts with Michael. I don't think we would have had texts in common that we were interested in reading in common. I vaguely recollect, I have a vague recollection, that the day before I submitted my DPhil, I thought I might have mistranslated something and went and checked it with him. It's a vague recollection, or maybe an imagination. But no, but yeah, I mean, yeah, and we got to know the whole the, the family and uh, went around there for dinner. In fact, I seem to remember that when that his Tibetan language classes were not held in the college; they were held at his his um, apartment in um, in um, what do you call it? That place halfway up uh, the Banbury Road, um, not Park 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 Town. Park Town. That's it. Yeah, I want to say Kemp Town. That's in Brighton, isn't it? Park Town. Yeah, he he. I still remember that they had an apartment there. Um, so yeah, so it was held there. Um, but then, of course, one has to remember that if he came, I don't remember exactly when he came. Did he? If he came in about seventy five six, okay. I was away seventy five to six in Edinburgh, and then I finished at the university in seventy eight, and I left Oxford in eighty or eighty one. So actually, my and I didn't see very much of him after that because once I moved here, I don't drive, and once I moved here, I was here. Um, I did occasionally see him over the years, and I do remember fairly close to the time that I'd heard he was ill, and that actually came as a, a surprise out of the blue, um, visiting him in his, and Sue was certainly back in Burma, visiting him in his apartment in, not certainly not in Parktown now, it was, uh, but it was in that same sort of area, uh, and full of Tibetan statues and things, and, and having and chatting with him, we might have had a drink. I don't, I don't quite remember. Um, and I can't quite remember what I was doing in Oxford then. It was, I was probably either up examining something or or, or something like that. Um, and that was the last time I saw him. Uh, and yeah, and and I I didn't realise he was ill. I mean, I wasn't. I was in. Uh, I was sufficiently out of the circle really to know that he was ill. Um, but then. When I heard he died, it was, it was a terrible um, um, a blow, terrible surprise. And then when I was asked if I would like to be a trustee of the Eris Memorial Fund with Anthony and Richard and Jeff Bamford, I think that, I think that was us. Um, I was, and funnily, I mean, not funnily enough, I mean, sadly enough, when I wasn't able to attend Michael's funeral either, because we were, we have a cottage on the Welsh borders um which is pretty remote and i i was away at the time um but when i had a chance to become a trustee i was very happy to do that and that was what set up buddhist studies that's uh, like tibetan studies in oxford that was what funded it got it going and of course all the hard work that richard and anthony put into that i attended the um wonderful concert in the sheldonian i seem to recall to raise funds for that because michael knew all kinds of important people um, and they were able to raise funds for that and uh, so I, I supported that uh, as far as I could um, and given my uh, distance here in Bristol uh, but and, and my, my um, connection with Michael and one of the not exactly the last time but one of the last times I saw Michael also was when he came to Bristol because Aung San Suu Kyi was given an, given an honorary doctorate by the university here and Michael came to receive it so that meant that I, I was able to meet up again with Michael then. I don't remember which year that was. Um, but yeah, he's a lovely man. And as I say, Anthony also absolutely delightful, so sweet and so um, warm, civilised, um, fun, uh, intelligent. And but, but the two of them being such identical twins was just weird. And I seem to remember Anthony smoked too much too. <laughs> Didn't drink though. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Is there anything else you would remember about putting the Tibetan studies at Oxford together? Well, I, it's so long ago. Um, I, as I, I do seem to recall being involved as an external assessor fairly recently in something that was happening, I think, in Tibetan studies. But basically, um, when just before Anthony died, he'd um, um, I, I I'd stopped being a trustee, 
of that charity, um, very happily, having done it for, 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 for quite a number of years. Um, and things were taking on a new direction. I got to know Charles Ramble, another very nice person, when he was there. And he and the things were going, I mean, things were, were, were happening there. And of course, Ulrika came and um, they started promoting uh, Tibetan, both Buddhist studies and Tibetan studies. And um, uh, that's tremendous. But I can't honestly say I was involved at that time. Uh, I had been involved. I'd given what um, you know I could at the time or what support I could give, given you know, what I was doing here. And things were beginning to take off. So I suppose one would see my role in vis-a-vis -vis that at Oxford as being um, someone who had the um, the background and was in a position to offer some help at the time, which is what I did. Um, but uh, that was, uh, and then things were able to to um, um, go. I mean, have gone on under their own steam really, and I've I've not been particularly involved in it recently. But uh, um, and I'm you know, this is what's happened in terms of Buddhist studies and in terms of Tibetan studies at Oxford is. Certainly, certainly in Tibetan studies, beyond what I would have, I could have imagined, all those years ago. I mean, it is absolutely fantastic, and it's due to the very hard work of a small number of people. Um, it, looking back over it, it doesn't surprise me. But absolutely, um, you know, it, it was. It, I, I didn't realize that time. There were times I thought over the years that um, you know, uh, Tibetan studies would 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 sort of die out in Oxford. Um, and there was a time, I think Richard would agree, that uh, had it not been for the really hard work he did, that there was a real worry before he retired that it, that it would. I mean, um, you know, he was, when I first came, he was the only person in Buddhist studies there. Uh, and um, when he retired, he was really, again, the only person in Buddhist studies, um, had it not been for the things that have happened. So, um, I mean, I might be, have my chronology wrong there because I can't quite exactly remember because uh, I mean uh, when Ulrika came but 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 anyway the point is that people like Richard have worked so hard to um, to to support Buddhist studies and um, and that includes working with Michael mm -hmm. with, with, with Anthony Eris to support Tibetan studies and it's brilliant it's really good I think but we I would never have um, imagined that so much could have happened. And now I see, you know, so many graduate students working in Tibetan studies and also learning to speak Tibetan. And I see Tibetan um, language assistants and things like that. My word, you're a lucky lot. Uh, I wish I'd had all that in my day. Um, but then if I'd had it all in my day, presumably there would have been someone else, a generation beforehand, who would have, would have been doing what, what we did. So that's, that's the way it is. Mentioning these changes, how would you say that approaches, maybe theoretical approaches or other academic approaches to Buddhism have changed? Yeah. Um, well, of course, in a way, I, I, I sort of touched on that earlier. Um, it looks to me as if, and remember, I'm now retired, so I'm, I've, I've been out of academic Buddhist studies for some years. But I think I would want to draw the, the, the opposition that I, I, I sort of, or, or maybe maybe develop the opposition that I, I mentioned earlier, between people like me who came into it um, with an interest in, in, in Buddhist, uh, very, very uh, theoretical Buddhist um, teachings or Buddhist um, um, viewpoints, as it were, um, around the idea of, of correct perception, seeing things the way they really are, yes, I'm seeing things the way they really are. And I know that over the years, I've always sort of started with, when teaching with, or pretty well started when teaching students, you know, Buddhism is all about transforming the mind so that you come to see things the way they really are and putting an end to the forces that lead to suffering that result from not seeing things the way they really are. And you know in, in the in the Buddhist um, thought book I'm underlying, I, 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 I'm emphasising that. Um, and that's the sort of world I came from. It's both the, the world that I came from in terms of um, my own interests, my own background in 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 in, in philosophy, in in ontology, and there in Um and and also, but also the sort of approach to Buddhism that was taken in those days. Ooh, and um, 
the uh, um, and it's not surprising in a way because a lot of the people who who got most interested or were interested in Buddhism in the um, uh, in, in, in for the first hundred years or so of the Western study of Buddhism, 150 years, were people who were approaching Buddhism with the same sort of orientation and interests, um, and sometimes with a with a with a positive antipathy towards uh, that you find in Christianity. So they were interested in issues of what is the ultimate reality, um, uh, and how should we behave in the light of that. And indeed, a lot of the earlier right Western writers on Buddhism were interested in contrasting the Buddhist approach to these issues with the Christian. Uh, not quite often um, to the to the disparagement of Christianity. They 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 wanted people to. Um, to to see that Buddhism didn't have the problems that Christianity had, philosophical problems, and therefore didn't have some of the moral problems that they perceived in Christianity. So I, the, the approach I took in the 60s, and I mean, you can illustrate this even in, I let me illustrate this in, 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 in one of my little hobby horses. Of course, when I came into this field, as you know, everyone approached Buddhism um, as saying, well, Buddhism has two schools called Theravada and Mahayana. I spent a lot of time under my, sort of over, working with that because we're not, that, you know, anyone who now says that is, I'm afraid, is completely out of touch with, with the study of Buddhism um, and indeed with Buddhism itself. So uh, it was similarly, you know, you had these things which when I came in, uh, influenced by indeed great scholars like um, you know like Edward Conzer in the English-speaking world, and and still you know, Etienne Mott for that matter, who was of course a very great scholar, um, there was still uh, models now that we didn't we won't adopt. Uh, sorry, that we that we find problematic. But this is still um, the point is still these are to do with Buddhist doctrines. What's happened now, if I'm right in understanding, is that the um, we're beginning, or, or, or people are beginning to realise that doctrines are not, um, and certainly doctrines about the nature of reality and all that sort of thing, while on on one level uh, are perhaps terribly important, um, um, uh, are not the are not what Buddhism is. No, no, how do I put it? They're not. They're not um, necessarily either the most important thing for Buddhists numerically. Or historically, and quite arguably, are not necessarily the best way into the study of Buddhism either. Um, and and I, I uh, and and I recognise that. Uh, and I think that also uh, we're now much more aware, and I'm jolly glad to, to to say it, of the sheer diversity, complexity, and multi-layered nature of Buddhism. One of the things I I quite often say to people when I'm talking about Buddhism. In a, in a non buddhological context, I say, look, Buddhism is very complicated. I'm glad to say that because that's how people like me make their money. Um, but, you know, and it, 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 it's amorphous um, in the same way that, of course, Christianity is very complicated. Um, you know, all religions are very complicated. They're very multifaceted. There are things within them that other people simply won't accept. Um, there are things within them which other people would, would considered to be sufficiently outside what is definitive of that religion to, to place people outside the religion. I mean, there are some Buddhists, for example, who would want to argue and have argued that, I think quite wrongly, that you know, someone like Shinran is not really a proper Buddhist. Or there's certainly people in Tibet um, who would want to argue, or yes, that, that um, a Zhendong interpretation of the Tathagatagarbha is really um, not Buddhist. Uh, we know Guru would say that. And indeed, you can also see what they're getting at there, but you can also see it's a very complex issue, uh, as um, as I have, I've mentioned in, in in the second edition of Mahayana Buddhism. Um, similarly, you know, on Christianity, from a Christian side, um, there are plenty of people, including myself, with my Christian hat on, who would say that non-Trinitarianism is is definite. It, it can't be Christian. In other words, if you're Unitarian or Jehovah's Witness, you're outside the bounds of Christianity. But, you know, you might say that with a particular um, um, uh, dogmatic, a particular sectarian hat on. But if you're a scholar looking at it from the outside, you seem to have to say that, the, I think you have to say, I mean, this is a, you know, the religion is the total of all the people who self-define as that religion. Um, and I make that point in, in Mahayana Buddhism when talking about, I think, at the end of that chapter, the second edition of that chapter on, on the Tathagatagarbha, again, and actually, uh, you know, a, a Zhentong type of interpretation of Tathagatagarbha, let's use that as a cipher, is widespread in Buddhist thought. Um, 
And it's no use people, Western scholars or indeed Galupas, come in and say, well, that's not Buddhist, is it? You know, or as some Western scholars have said, well, it, it can't mean what it looks like it means because that wouldn't be Buddhist, would it? Well, yeah, that's, that's not, not the approach. Anyway, but that's still dealing with theory. As I said, I, I think that um, in terms of um, the, the, the study of Buddhism now and the study of Tibetan studies now, I'm glad to say there's much, much more interest in um, understanding what, 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 you know, what Buddhists do. Uh, and I was, I said earlier, I was really awakened to this by um, uh, people working in, I wish I could remember his name now, because he's a very good scholar, I'm very well known. Anyway, someone working in Nepalese Buddhism who really showed me that there might not be, no, I'll rephrase that, really showed me that there was so much of interest in, in what Nepalese Buddhists do and are still doing that would cast quite an interesting insight uh, on, on, on Tibetan um, history the history of Tibetan thought uh, that I'd completely missed because I wasn't, you know, I thought, well, they're just doing all these things, but there's not much philosophy there. Um, David Gellner. I, no, it wasn't David Gellner, although, of course, David Gellner is one. No, he's an American scholar. He's the one who I've actually corresponded with. And, in fact, I um, I wrote a, a, an in, a forward and something for one of his books. But it wasn't David Gellner. But, of course, yes, I'm glad you mentioned David Gellner because, of course, I, David Gellner is a very great scholar. And he is another one who um, I overlapped with I think I think he was here a little he was a little bit after me but but very much of that that era but yes of course David Gellner yeah yeah um. Paul lots has been written about your conversion you have written about your conversion and um you have been asked. unfortunately I was one of the ones who wrote <laughs> something about it as well no it's not been unfortunately I did go public how would you say that it, the conversion has changed your view of Buddhism, if it has? Oh, that's just such a difficult question. I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's, 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 it's difficult to get a handle on it. Um, yes, OK, let's, let's, let's try and see what comes out. Yes, of course, I, I became a Catholic, and I made it quite clear all along that my... Looking back on it, I, I mean, I was when I was a Buddhist, I was clear I was a Buddhist um, for whatever reason. And I've always had an interest in interest, not intellectual, a, a living interest in my studies, my work um, being part of my own life, my, my, my relation to the world. And I, I define being a member of religion as something to, among other things, it's not a definition, among other things, as being bound up with one's relationship to the world, relationship in the sense of how one understands the world and also how one behaves in the world. Um, and as a Buddhist, I, I, I did that as a Buddhist. Incidentally, of course, as a Western Buddhist, I wasn't a Tibetan Buddhist. Um, a Western Buddhist is a Western Buddhist with, 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 with my story. Um, um, therefore, and, and, and I eventually, I did become a Catholic. Yes, I mean, I have become a Catholic. And I should just say on that, that um, um, well, two things crossed my mind. First of all, I went very public on it. In other words, I read a book about it. Uh, and I didn't write the book as um, in order to challenge or provoke or, or anything like that. And I certainly didn't write the book as a contribution to Christian Buddhist studies, which unfortunately too many people have taken it as being. It was, a, it was, it was really was, as I said in the book, an apologia. It was an explanation of why I was doing what I was doing, given that I knew that a lot of people would think I was being uh, probably off my head. And indeed, incidentally, the original title of the book was going to be Out of My Head. They, they wouldn't let me. Um, and what I did was that people would, I would, people would, would, um, would, would give various um, arguments for not becoming a, a Catholic, either for not becoming a Catholic or for not becoming a Christian or for not ceasing to be a Buddhist or whatever. And so I simply wrote down what my responses were and assembled those into a, into a, a book because I found that it was such an important thing to me. And also I was so aware that some people might be, um, find it um, 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 difficult because I, I sort of had a bit of a, I suppose a bit of a profile, um, that I wanted to be sure that what I said was thought through. Um, uh, but it very much was a set of my own reflections. I would, I would, um, people would say, but well, you can't become Buddhist for this reason. Sorry, <laughs> can't go Catholic for this reason. And I would go and I would, I would jot down 
and assembled that. So, but then I and then I did publish the book, um, and um, in some ways, of course, you know, it was written at the time. It was written very quickly, and um, I I now. Um, uh, I've been challenged over the years. I had a very interesting um, conference at which I was challenged by Jose Cabazon. Uh, it has all been published. Uh, and I think he was right to challenge me on some things. I was, um, I was very much speaking at that time and I was very keen to, um, to, to, for myself to separate where I was going now from my Buddhism. I certainly didn't want anyone, as happens sometimes, people to say to me, oh, you were a Buddhist, now you're a Catholic, but really, you're still a Buddhist, aren't you? Um, or you're, you're a Catholic who really thinks that Buddhism and Catholicism are the same. No, I'm not. I'm not like that, I'm afraid. And I wanted to distinguish myself. I wanted to differentiate myself. And I remember Jose saying to me at one point, um, and he was absolutely right, it's a bit like being married and then getting divorced. You know, you have to distinguish yourself from your previous partner. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and now you've got your new partner. And Jose said, I wish to speak up on behalf of you know, the, your previous, previous partner. Um, and that was quite right. And I do think now, and, and this is in print, that um, some of the things I said in that book, particularly around the area of, of compassion and, and, and uh, ethics and things like that, were a bit strongly said. Um, um, on the ontological side, on the other hand, I, I still, I, if anything, I'd be even stronger now. But that's, that's, that's uh, uh, different. So, but yes, yeah, so, so I did go public on it. Um, I wrote the book as a personal story. It wasn't intended to be an academic book. Uh, and I've been, I won't say touched, I've been annoyed, if anything, over the years by people who've treated it as an academic book and have wanted me to take part in Christian Buddhist dialogue, which is not my field, um, and have seen it as being a contribution to that. It, it never was. It was always, perhaps even in an egotistic way, it was always just simply saying, you know, this is my apologia. Um, having said all that, I should just add for people who think, you know, I, say in, I do say in the book at some point, they tell me the honeymoon period is soon over. Um, for me, it's not. I'm, I'm utterly still in, as in love with the Catholic Church, notwithstanding the problems of the Catholic Church um, now, as I was when I joined it. I'm, I feel completely at home. Yeah. One of my students said to me, I knew you were a Catholic all along. Um, but um, yes, and, I, and, 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 and I, by and large, my Buddhist friends um, have been very charitable about, at least to me in, in public. I know that I, I, there were some uncharitable things said by people who didn't know me on... Uh, in the media and so on, but um, but then your question was, how has it therefore altered my view of Buddhism? And I just I just can't answer it. I mean, it, you know, in a way, I mean, Buddhism was just such an important part of my life, um, and in many ways, it still moulds parts of my way of seeing. People, when I speak with Catholic friends, they often assume that I must be still practicing Buddhist meditation and and sort of very keen on mindfulness and that sort of thing. For many, for a long time, not so. Um, part of my differentiating myself from Buddhism um, was precisely, and indeed even in some ways intellectually, to um, not be interested in Buddhist meditation, not to get involved in that. In more recently, I, I I'm sort of now feel that I'm sufficiently distant to be able to um, appreciate more some some of the, the the modern, as Rupert would say, Rupert Gethin would say, um, the modern. Um, very much westernised and not traditional types of mindfulness. Um, I certainly need something like that to fo help focus my mind and to calm down. Um, but I, I don't, by and large, and I didn't, when I became a, a Christian, uh, get wrapped up in Christian mystics. So I'm rather sympathetic to the person. Was it Newman? I don't know who said that mysticism begins in, begins in mist and ends in schism, um, which, uh, um, so I, I've tended to be a little bit, sort of wary about the so-called Christian mystics, whatever that is, and certainly wary about aspects of, um, of, of Christianity that want to emphasize um, what I call funny experiences. In other words, uh, experience rather than, 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 than dogma, if you like. Um, okay, I'm still um, avoiding the issue of how has it altered my approach to Buddhism. Um, I love Buddhism. I loved my, my, my Buddhist friends. I learned an enormous amount about uh, or enormous amount from Buddhism. Well, I learned enormous amount. I suppose I learned enormous amount about, about Buddhism as well. I don't know. Um, there are some areas of Buddhism which, over the years, I remain in much with much more affection than others. Funnily enough, 
given my own background, one of the areas that I found most influential on me in, Christ in Buddhist terms when I became a Christian and even before um, was perhaps not surprisingly um, um, uh, Jodo Shinshu or Shinran. And when I was working on Shinran for that book, both the first and the second editions, uh, and therefore really having to get down and, and think, study and think through Shinran, I found an enormous amount there that, that made good, very good sense to me, um, and some that didn't. But I still think, I, as, a, as a Christian, I still find Shinran's um, reflections on the significance of and incredible difficulty of, while at the same time apparently it being very simple, letting go. Um, letting go. Trust as being very important to me as a Christian too. Uh, and I, so I still very much admire particularly Shinran. There are some other aspects of Buddhism which I have, have less sympathy for intellectually and spiritually now, but that's understandable. Um, but by and large, I suppose, um, since becoming a Christian, and one needs to remember time passes so quickly. I became a Christian at the beginning of the year 2000, I think, or 2000. So I've now been, been a Catholic for, for nearly 20 years, which is not as long, but getting on for as long as I was a Buddhist. Uh, and now most of my my study is in is in is in in that sort of area. And what's more, I don't do academic study really, even even in Christian studies anymore. Most of my interest now in reading is in, um, along with my my involvement in social action, is in in prayer, is in is in practical matters. Um, and 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 as a Dominican, um, in living the Dominican life. Um, I now mix totally with Catholics. Sometimes I reflect back that I'm now mixed with Catholics in the same way that all those years ago I used to mix with Buddhists, and I find that an interesting thing and a deepening thing in many ways. Uh, it helps improve, it helps develop my empathy, my understanding, my, my, my tolerance, my, uh, um, um, my love of others. Um, but having said all that, by and large nowadays, and it might sound funny really for people who only know me through my work as an academic in Buddhism, in Buddhism and remembering that I'm, not, I'm retired, Buddhism doesn't actually have much to do with my life now. Um, we all develop, we all get older. Uh, what you is terribly important to you now may well not be what's terribly important to you in 30 years or 40 years time. And um, I occasionally reach down a book on Buddhism and look and think, like, you know, guess all those years ago, yeah, I used to do that. Or I knew about that. Or sometimes I even reach down one of my own books and think, good gracious me, did I really know all that? Um, I don't know. Forgotten it all. All gone. Um but that's all right. I'm okay with that. And you said that one's religion is tied to one's understanding and behaving in the world. How has these two aspects changed? How has my understanding and behaving in the world? Um, well, in, in, in one very direct sense, of course, I now go to church on Sundays. <laughs> Indeed, I go to church most days. Um, as, 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 and I live, as I, live, I live the Catholic life. Um, from the moment I wake up in the morning um, to the moment I go to bed at night. But more, more, perhaps more centrally, um, oh, and of course, on, you know, come Wednesday, it'll be Ash Wednesday, so I'll be going along getting the ashes and giving up things for Lent and everything like that. Um, I am a pretty traditional Catholic, but more importantly, I think, and this is important to me, is that my life now, um, certainly since finishing at the university, uh, is, to is very much bound up with engagement, with um, helping people on the streets. Well, I mean, on the streets in the broadest sense of the word. In other words, I'm, um, as, uh, you know, I'm very much involved now with, um, with, with uh, extending, no, how do I put it? With, with, with practical ac action to show love on, uh, to people who are in need of love in the broadest sense of the word. Um, and I'm, I, I'm certainly not wanting to say that that's not what Buddhists do. That wasn't really what I did that much of when I was a Buddhist. Um, 
Or in other words, of course, we all know that Christians, people sometimes say to me, you know, why do you go out doing this? And I say, well, it's just what Christians do, isn't it? Um, and, um, but for me personally, it means that I have, I now, um, I don't lecture, I don't teach Buddhist philosophy. Uh, I'm not sure I can remember, you know, the different categories of, of uh, Yabhidharma or, or Chittamatra or whatever. All those things I used to know so well, I could, I could talk for them endlessly off the top of my head. I didn't even need to, you know, I don't do any of that anymore. What I do do now is I'm, I, I, I live, I work in a world um, in, and I spend a lot of time in a world in which I have no expertise, no background. Um, um, and I sometimes find very awkward. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm on the streets at night. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to make it sound, you know, special or grand or anything, but, but we patrol the streets at night as street passers. We, we go out and we try to help people who need help on the streets. People who, um, not because we think we're, we're good or anything like that, but because there are people who need help on the streets. So I don't mean the homeless. I do do work with the homeless, but that's a different thing. I mean, people who are very vulnerable in the clubbing areas of Bristol in the early hours of the morning, people who are drunk, who've lost contact with their friends, who have, um, their mobiles aren't working, they've got no money, particularly young ladies. Uh, they're very scantily dressed quite often and they're very vulnerable and we're making sure that they get home safely. Why, why are we doing that? Well, we're quite explicitly Christian. We're all Christian and we're doing that because we care. And um, we care that people um, feel safe, that, 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 that we can, and we're also people who have something that we can um, do to help them. We're not, we, we're not preachers, we don't go there, we're not allowed to preach apart from anything else. I mean, we're not out there to convert anyone, we're out there simply to make sure people are safe. Um, and you know, just two days ago, one young chap, very drunk, and we were able to make sure he got home safely. Um, in the cl you know, clubbing areas of the streets at night can be quite wild in Bristol. I'm sure it's the same in Oxford. And it's, that's the sort of thing I do now. Um, and what's more, as teams, we're very well trained. Uh, we're in uniform. We're, we have links with the CCTV and we're ecumenical. We're, 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 no, we're um, um, uh, more than one denomination. So it means that all those years I spent working on the minutiae of um, different interpretations of emptiness, I now spend time badly um, on the ground at night with someone who is vomiting with, as a Catholic, with others from other Christian denominations, uh, evangelicals very often, and remembering the history of the evangelical Catholic rivalry. And we're not talking theology. We're not talking about emptiness. We're not, well, apart from the fact that guys busy emptying, <laughs> busy emptying themselves, I'm sorry about that. Um, um, you know, and we're not, we're not um, doing theology. We're not to have differences. Um, we're out there helping people who need help and someone has to do it. Um, and the local authorities really appreciate what we do. We get a lot of support. We get people who come up to us and say, you guys are doing great work and, and so on. And, and I love it and I'm very committed to it. So that's one of the things I'm very involved with. Uh, so in answer to your question, yeah, that's pretty different from when I was uh, um, doing British studies and I don't want to make anything grand about it. Um, all I can say is that I, uh, I learnt an enormous amount from Buddhism over the years. Um, the last 10 years or so of my involvement with, with, this, with, that, with the, this sort of thing, with, with street pastors and also now the big project that I'm doing to uh, help Syrian refugees and another group, I'm a trustee for a, a charity that helps get homeless people off the streets. That sort of thing has, um, has, well, let's just see, in terms of, I mean, you know that when you study something really well, you think it really improves your knowledge of that subject. That's great, you know, and the years that I, I would pour over Tibetan texts and I'd come out thinking, yeah, I think I've, I think I've got that better. Okay, put that to one side. Working with the people on, that I'm doing now on the streets, I come away feeling, yeah, I've really got an enormous amount more as a what? As a human being or, or more? No, in, in Christian terms, I've, I've come, I feel closer to, to, to God or you can say if you want closer to, to the way things are and ought to be, what, how things really are, what we're, what we're for from that um, now a days. And I wouldn't give up that to go back to being uh, to working in Mount Uh Definitely not, no. And I suppose in a way, uh, the one 
I sometimes think all that stuff, all the Majjana Kavats will point me in this direction. Um, yeah, I hope so. Um, but let me just say something else funny, because I've never stated this out, out publicly, but I don't mind stating it out publicly. When I became a Catholic, um, several Buddhist friends, most of my Buddhist friends that I knew, Buddhist friends, were, were extremely polite and tolerant, and as they would be. Um, uh, one friend, one very good friend, uh, Stephen Batchelor, I think, actually said, I respect your decision, but I find it incomprehensible, which is totally understandable. Um, I know that some people were very, very um, annoyed and upset or thought I was completely mad. What no one ever at any point, given that I made it clear that I was a, a Buddhist, had been a Buddhist, no one at any point ever said to me, it's all skillful means. He's never, he's not really a Catholic. He's only doing it as a bodhisattva action to help people and to reach people. Now, there's a sense in which, with an understanding of the, of Mahayana, with an understanding of the bodhisattva, um, and if you understand that the person is really trying to practice it, that would have been an obvious thing to have said. Well, of course, totally right, William's becoming Catholic because you know, the bodhisattvas will do that. We know, for example, that um, um, Avalokiteshwara appears in the form of Shiva, things like that. No one ever said that. And I found that very interesting, really, and I've never ever stated this out loud. Um, all my, the people I, who spoke to me about it, with all their knowledge of Buddhism, to me, in a way, never, no, in a way, didn't internalise their Buddhism enough to think it might have been a skillful means. Mm -hmm. It's not skillful means, incidentally, I'm totally a Catholic, but who knows? <laughs> <laughs> well, I just did find that. But then on the other hand, another part of me wants to say, well, who, you know, why should I be so self-obsessed? I mean, but that was just the things that crossed my mind at that time. Um, that, that, uh, because it's perfectly coherent for someone to be a, to be a Bodhisattva and have taken Bodhisattva vows and all that sort of thing and decide that being a Catholic might be the appropriate thing to do for the benefit of sentient beings at that point. Either way, it doesn't really matter. The fact is that I now um, try to be of some use. And I find it a great challenge because, I, as I say, I'm not... You know, if I see someone who is very, very unwell on the streets at night, as I often do, and they're, you know, there's mayhem around them and they're, they're ill, my natural tendency is to mull it over and to think, hmm, I wonder what we can do here. Whereas my colleagues are already down there helping. Um, and that's good. I, 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 I learned something from that. Could I ask you, what has been your main religious experience? <laughs> I don't go for experiences. No. Um, no, I mean, as a Buddhist, like, well, of course, religious experience is an incredibly ambiguous expression. Um, there, there are, in one sense, uh, anyone who is religious, by definition, is having a religious experience. So I go to church, and that's a religious experience. I pray, and that's a religious experience. But quite often what we mean is, has, have one had supernatural experiences? Experiences like, you know, like St Paul had, um, you know, or, or sudden experiences of flashing lights and, you know, visions and all that sort of thing. In that sense of the word, religious experience, I don't have those. I don't know what I'd do with them if I had them. I sometimes think if God appeared and said, Paul, I've come to see you. Um, I would, but given my background, I would be extremely sceptical. <laughs> I think I must be hallucinating. <laughs> so, um, no, I mean, and, and, and in terms of meditation and things like that, I was never any good at meditating. I used to teach it, but I wasn't any good at it. But then what is being good at meditation? We all know that. There's no being good at it. You just do it. Um, people sometimes think when I became a Catholic, I must have had some sort of incredible mystical experience. Absolutely not. Um, what I say in my book, in the conversion book, is, is it. I mean, it was a rational process. As a, a Catholic theologian, um, I, I, I very much um, um, accept the, the, the de-emphasizing um, to a certain extent, let's say, of religious experience in, in the Catholic tradition. Catholics have, of course, there's plenty of Catholics who've had very rich religious experiences uh, in that sense, but um, Catholic theology has tended to want to de-emphasise it because the more you go towards religious experience and the more important you make it, the more you're going towards privatisation 
And the church, rightly, I think, is very wary of privatisation. Uh, and in my early work, um, like the conversion book and some of the stuff I did just after, um, I, I was that was another one of the things I really wanted to, uh, to, to emphasise strongly. Buddhists might be into experiences, but as a Christian, it's not experiences that I'm into. Um, and uh, I don't consider them to be important. Uh, the the important thing is 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 certainly in you know this I'm still a group is, is reasoning, but the most important experience of all that we have as um, as Christians as Catholics is 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 essentially communal. It's part of the community, and so as a Catholic, uh, I have to say, even when it gets boring, um, that going to mass is by far the most important experience for me. Um, but but really, in another way. I think I want to say that it's very difficult to get my finger up, get my hand on it. There's another sense in which I'm not, I don't look anymore for funny experiences, but I often feel enormous sense of love of others and gratitude, which but then that might be just because I'm older than I was when I was a Buddhist. One of the things that's very important, has become very important to me, and even back then, um, was, the, was the importance of gratitude. And it's something which I see in Shinran again. I mean, Jodi Shinshu emphasizes gratitude. I don't, and I, I see it in some aspects of Buddhism. You, you have great gratitude for your Lama, for example. But I don't see it in, in a very radical sense that I get in Christianity. And gratitude is, is so important to me. So, I mean, I will now... Uh, if you want to talk about religious experiences, I will, you know, I, I sometimes say, I mean, after a night out on the streets, the la the, the, two, the couple of hours after that, I just feel so strong sense of I have, I have been doing, you know, Aristotelian language, I've been doing that which I, what I was meant to do. And also just enormous gratitude to every, to, to the people I meet, to everyone. And, and ultimately, of course, to God for the for the incredible um, um, sort of blessings I've 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 had, and indeed my story, um, and that includes becoming a Buddhist. Of course, um, if I hadn't been a Buddhist all those years, uh, I would have. Uh, well, I, I would have. It wouldn't be the me that I am now, and I'm actually quite comfortable with the me I am now. I haven't always been, but I am now, and so yeah. So 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 in that sense, I think. Uh, but yeah, that that that's all on um, on 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 sort of my own personal perspective. But yes, I, I I still remain certainly theoretically wary about experiences, religious experiences, um, and uh, I'm not sure if I ever had a full flown one. You know, what I would make of it. Anyway, I haven't, and I won't. <laughs> <laughs> and having such a deep personal experience with two religions. What is your perception on the coexistence of different religions in the world? Oh, what a good question. Uh, yes. Um, and in a way, it, it, it touches on a number of things, some of which uh, I'm going to sidestep because they're entering into areas in which I don't feel I have the expertise. So it is very much my own reflection on, on this. I think, uh, and also, first of all, um, we need to to be clear about what religions we're talking about. For example, um, are we to include among religions? Uh, let me think of an extreme example: um, the religions of, um, of of people for whom their essential aspect is eating their neighbour, or let's say Aztec tearing out the heart religions. I assume we're not talking about those because my tolerance for for having people have their hearts torn out would not be that great uh, and my tolerance for a religion that considered that they had to eat their neighbours um, would not be that great <laughs> um, so we'll put those to one side let's just say we're talking about the um, the, 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 the what's called the world's great religions so uh, um, then I then I my my view is my view is um, uh, that in a way it's it is it, it, OK, it's my personal view and there's also the, the, the theological view of, of the church because I don't differ that much in, in, in intellectual terms. From that. It, it, all religions have some very wonderful things in them. All religions on some level have some not so good things in them. If you're talking about the history of the religions as well as the doctrines, uh, all religions 
no, practitioners of all religions have to better live together in harmony and mutual respect and tolerance and love. That has to be done by people who also accept that they have differences, that they differ. So the question is, how do we live together in tolerance, harmony and love with people with whom we have often uh, um, radical differences, uh, intellectual differences and coarse differences in, in, in behaviour? I don't find, once it's put that way, too much of a problem with that. Uh, I don't see any need to go down the road of thinking, in fact I think it's quite wrong, that we could only have the appropriate level of tolerance if we all agreed on the same thing. In fact, quite the reverse. I think that tolerance does not occur where you all agree. Tolerance is precisely because where you don't agree, but, 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 but you tolerate. I equally don't have any problem with the idea of saying that I, in some very radical ways, indeed essential ways as a, as a Catholic, differ from, 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 from when I was a Buddhist, or indeed differ from, from, from Judaism, of course, or from Islam. Uh, we know we differ. Of course we differ, but I equally, uh, as a, as a, in terms of the, the harmony between religions, I think we can live utterly together in harmony. But more importantly, in a way for me, although that's important too, is on the individual personal level. So, um, um, you know, person X here is, 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 a, is a Muslim or is Jewish. I can not only live with them, I, I can respect them enormously and, um, and, and, and love them and be friends, um, even though we radically differ. And in many ways, I can recognise their own spirituality as being much greater than anything I've got. And I want to give you some examples, um, very pertinent examples nowadays. Over the years, particularly due to my connection with the, um, the, the SHAP Working Party on World Religions and Ethics, which would have members of, of various religions, um, uh, and also my other work in, in, when I was a Buddhist indeed, in interfaith contact, um, some of the very nicest people I've ever met have actually been Muslim. Uh, and I'll give you a, an example which still stays with my mind. We were, many years ago, a group of us were at a, um, a, a, an annual get-together in London. And the evening we went to visit one of the mosques, the big mosques in London. And one of our party at that time was a well-known rabbi a rabbi, Hugo Green, uh, who used to be very well known in this country because he was often on the radio. And he'd been at Auschwitz. Um, he'd also been the rabbi to the Jews of southern India at one point. Um, a remarkable man. And um, another one who smoked a lot, incidentally, <laughs> died some years ago. But he and we went to the mosque and one of the mosque elders was um, asked to come and talk to us. And we sat on the floor in the mosque and the elders started talking about Islam. And he stopped and he looked towards Hugo and he said, you're Jewish, aren't you? And Hugo said, yep. This was in the big London mosque. And the, the, uh, the, uh, the Muslim elder, I didn't think it was an imam, but anyway, he looked and he looked and he said, I've known many Jews in my time and everyone was a splendid person. And I just found that so moving. I thought, you know, this was a time of tension between Jews and Muslims. And, um, I just found that now you know, I don't myself share. I mean, I radically differ from Islam on, as a Christian um, on, on on important things. Um, I differ from Jews on, on on certain things too, of course. Of course, I do. Otherwise, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be Christian. Um, similarly, I now differ radically from Buddhists on certain things. As a Buddhist, of course, I accepted re re reincarnation, rebirth, or whatever you want to call it. I don't now. Um, I accepted a particular way of seeing the world, which I don't now in terms of, of ontology. I now think philosophically, that, and I've written on this, that, that these issues are, are, um, are much more complex and I don't think that necessarily the Buddhist position is, is going to be defensible. And that's, therefore I, I, I recognise I disagree with Buddhists. I also have enormous respect, um, uh, admiration, I think in many ways, you know, followers of religion, whatever, Buddhism or, or Islam or whatever, uh, are much, much, um, um, can be, not can be, but often are, uh, much, much um, 
shall I say, spiritually rich, I don't know what the words are, than, than, than I am. Uh, and I've certainly met plenty of Christians who I'm, I have <laughs> sort of have sometimes have my doubts about. But, um, but, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Uh, so in terms of your question on religious people, religions living together, I, I don't have any problem with that. I do have a problem with some of the approaches to this. I think that nowadays um, religions, particularly Christianity, I'm sorry to say, comes under enormous pressure from very intolerant people. And those intolerant people are not um, um, Buddhists, Hindus, Jews or Muslims. They're, they're the intolerant secular community, uh, which are, uh, and it, 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 that is very worrying. Um, people who introduce things which Christians cannot in all conscience accept uh, and, 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 and impose it on Christians. Um, so I, I find that. So I find plenty of intolerance around. Unfortunately, uh, religions, by and large, certainly in, by and large, are able to live together in perfect harmony. But some of the secular religions, a bit like, of course, as you, you know, communism, um, you know, are not able to live uh, very tolerantly with with other religious faiths, uh, and and I find that um, worrying and um, uh, for the future. And I do think that it may be in the future that you know that we we have to stand up and uh, and be willing to suffer for our faith. And and that's that's the way it is. I also think that one of the ways of dealing with this, which has been common in in the last since the Enlightenment, let's say, um, which I wouldn't share, is that of the privatization of religion. In other words, religions. Um, can survive together perfectly well, providing they are seen as being totally your own private affair. Um, no religions historically, to the best of my knowledge, have been private affairs. Uh, and it's, a, it's a, another act of, um, of extreme um, uh, secular intolerance to trying to force religion to be a private affair. Uh, as a Catholic, you know, we have a very clear social message and we're very concerned about social engagement. Muslims too, of course, and, and Jews too. And I certainly think in the modern world, one of the ways in which uh, Buddhism has um, been influenced by, uh, particularly, is in developing its, its social um, message and, and, and engage Buddhism. Uh, and that's, you know, that's tremend absolutely tremendous. And there's plenty of Buddhist resources for that. And it's no use um, privatising religion and getting really, really annoyed when the religious believer says, you know, we have something to say about the about the the public space. Indeed, the privatization of religion is really the destruction of religion. I think it's another form of emphasizing religious experience in a way. Religion is all about funny feelings, and you can have your funny feelings in your own closet. <laughs> you know, just don't bring it out and and actually campaign for um, the end to various you know, things that your religion considers ought to be ended. Um, yeah. Once you privatise religion, you, 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 religion will cease to have any impact, and uh, um, religion, religion should have an impact. But you can do all that with tolerance, you can do all that with total openness, acceptance and, and so on. And as I say, some of my very best friends have been, um, um, particularly over the years, uh, Muslims, Hindus and Jews, I've never known many Sikhs, I don't think. Um, and nowadays, of course, I mean, and this is sort of the same sort of thing in a way, given historically, a lot of my very, very, very best friends are all from different Protestant denominations. And that includes you know, only just the other day, uh, one of my former students, who's a lovely chap, and he's from Northern Ireland, you know, and he, he's, he comes from a Presbyterian background, so you've got that sort of history as well, Catholics and, um, yeah. Uh, to Paul, we have a few concluding questions that we ask the same to everyone. Mm -hmm. So the first is, personally, what has your career in Buddhist studies or Tibetan studies given to you? My career? Yeah. How is it? A oh, pretty good income. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, oh, I don't know. I mean, the... the, 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 the my, okay, are we emphasizing here the word career? Or are we emphasising the content involved? I mean, content, my academic career. Yes. I mean, the content of the study of Tibet, things Tibetan. Mm -hmm. And it, it has, has given me... Um, well, it, 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 mm, I'm almost sort of Buddhist approach to this. I mean, we are each of us a story, um, a developing story, a story that's not yet over. And my story 
at any particular point at which it, we, we refer to it is me at that point. So the story of me, me now, is a story which is built on all, all that I've done in, in Buddhist studies and in Tibetan studies. So what has it given me? It's given me. <laughs> Um, um, so yeah, in terms of the content, and indeed, partly I've I sort of partly when I, because I was always personally involved, when I was a Buddhist, my Tibetan work, my Buddhist studies, was giving me a lot of my um, perception on the world at that time. That's why when I ceased to be a Buddhist, it, I needed to distinguish myself from that and therefore in a way um, change or um, reduce what it was giving to me and actually this is slightly we didn't touch on this but when I first became a Catholic several people who were not in in the field of religious studies or anything like that said well but can you still carry on teaching Buddhist studies in that case Meaning, I think, I think that what they meant was either or both, um, are you allowed to? <laughs> and also, um, do you feel you can? And I do remember saying, you know, with, with a certain impatience, well, of course I can. Um, one of the first things we get over to our students is you don't have to follow a religion in order to teach it. But as a matter of simple descriptive fact, over the years, I sort of, began to lose the edge in teaching Buddhism. Somehow, when I was a Buddhist, I found I could teach it with more, more sort of conviction or enthusiasm or something. I don't know, anyway, what I do. Um, and gradually I was not so, together with the fact I was having to do all the admin and everything like that, I was less interested in it anymore. Um, so in that sense, um, that's also slightly related to your question, I think. Uh, what has it given me? What has Tibetan studies? It's given me, it's given me me, and the way in which I um, relate to and appropriate Tibetan studies uh, from the time I started in it has given me the me from then on up to the me now. But the way in which I relate to and appropriate it now is quite different from the way I related to and appropriated it twenty years ago or thirty years ago, um, and that's how it should be. I, mean, I think that's how it should be. Um, to be, as Newman said, something like to be to be human is to change, and uh, mm -hmm. and something like to be fully human is to change often, or something like that. I remember Richard Gombrich saying to me when he heard I was becoming a Catholic, not something he is that particularly. I mean, he's never felt the move to be a Catholic himself. I don't think he said to me, "It'll be a Muslim next." Um, <laughs> I'm very happy to say that I have, I have not felt the move to uh, start on uh, becoming a Muslim. <laughs> what did you find the most interesting and the most challenging in your work? In Tibetan studies? Um, let's do the most challenging first. The most challenging for me personally was, I suppose, feeling sufficiently confident in the Tibetan language of the material I was working in to be able to feel sufficiently sufficient mastery of the material to start to do what for me was really always at some level the most important thing which is to engage with it in a critical way. Um, I, 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 um, I, would, I would wrestle with texts really um, and always aware that I might be getting it wrong, and I don't actually, I don't actually have a particular problem with that now. Although at the time, I think I did uh, the fear of getting it wrong. Now that doesn't bother me. I mean, I'm sort of, yeah, probably do I don't get it wrong. But but it was always a fear that one would get it would would not, you know, that, that one's Tibetan was not sufficiently sort of fluent and fluid enough to in in in, in some very technical. Um, texts, particularly when you're dealing with different traditions to the one you're most familiar with, to feel that you're 
you're, you're, you're really getting it. You don't have sufficient mastery of all the material. Of course, um, you know, for anyone who's a geshe, they, they know all this like that. Um, and, and we don't study that way. In fact, actually, we don't study that way, so we don't memorise it, apart from the Westerners, like George Dreyfus, another chap who I very much like, by the way, who's be become guest. But basically, uh, you know, I would always say we don't memorise. I can't remember where this comes from. It's all in books. Um, but what we do have as Western scholars is a particular training in, in a critical ability to think. And I was uh, it's a bit unfortunate when that's not being used. OK, so now what was the um, the other thing was, what did I find the most the most attractive? Interesting. Part? Interesting. It sort of is the other side of that, I suppose. Um, um, it's, 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 and I've already mentioned the sheer excitement early on of, of getting access to all kinds of things, uh, um, which, which others hadn't got access to. So the most interesting is really, um, and it became less and less over the years, having the time to sit down with a pile of texts, or perhaps even just one text, uh, and to look at it and to think, right, I'm going to devote, you know, a couple of months to uh, unravelling these, these, um, what, what this is saying and um, looking at what the different commentaries say on it. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I just found that at the time um, enormously interesting, in some ways rather indulgent. You have to have time to be able to do that uh, in terms of research. Uh, but, and, 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 then, and then writing something about it that seemed to make sense. Uh, uh, and publishing it and seeing it come home free, <laughs> which I haven't done for some years now. But yeah, so I suppose I suppose it's that. But you know, just to repeat again, as um, the more one does as an academic, the less I found time really to to have that pleasure. So enjoy it now while you're graduate students, um, because it's a real privilege to be able to do that sort of thing. Um, I think. And, uh, Paul, what do you see? Your most significant academic contributions and why? Oh, I don't know. I'll leave that to others, I think. Um, it's a funny, funny to even think about it. It doesn't, um, it doesn't enter my thoughts nowadays. Um, I really do think I leave it to others. I mean, I, 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 I suppose, I mean, I think that it, it's better to say what do I think has had some um, use in some sort of way that transcends the individual moment of reading it. I suppose my Mahayana Buddhism, in a way, funnily enough, it's not the thing so I, that have been my real heavy duty research stuff. I do think that probably, given given my you know, the period that I've I've been working that some of the things which I started doing and some of the people I started looking at now you know more people are doing and are looking at and perhaps I can claim to have been there at the beginning one thing you need to bear in mind in terms of Tibetan studies is that um, even during my day and now even more so many 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 more texts have, have, have come been surfaced. And I remember digging around years ago. I mean, you know, when I came across that uh, Majapajantra Sundru text, you know, there was virtually nothing else. I think there's more of his stuff around now. Um, and um, um, so in a way, uh, what, even for that reason, what we were doing is, is, is fairly, is, 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 is fairly readily superseded. But my Mahayana Buddhism book, again, which, you know, it's a textbook really, um, is one which I still think I'm still pleased with. I think the, the not the first edition, although I was pleased with that at the time. I think the second edition still um, has a lot of interesting things, and I think and I and I, I was I learnt so much from it that there is a lot uh, in it in a lot of areas in which I don't claim great expertise, and it helped me sort out my own thoughts. Uh, and also, I think it has um, has had a value for for students who want to um, really come to grips with this stuff. I, but on the other hand, I'm also, myself nowadays, I suspect, and perhaps I'm also critical of, the idea of simply courses on Mahayana Buddhism. I think nowadays we're, uh, one of the reasons why there's not, not really been a, another book um, like that is because, correctly, I suspect, now in universities, they're not doing those sorts of courses anymore. You've not got a course called Mahayana Buddhism. Um, and I think that's probably right. I think we need to focus and say, look, we're going to work on um, Japanese Buddhism of the 13th century. 
<laughs> or something like that, or, or we're going to look at you know uh, Tibetan religion of the of the of the of the eleventh century or or twelfth century or something like that. So that might be it. But I still think I, that that's a book that I'm still pleased with. I think um, there was one reviewer who said that a book with so many footnotes must have been written by someone who was some sort of sadist. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the idea was that people could read the, 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 the body of the book if they wanted to basically find out about Mahayana Buddhism, but if they were really scholars, they could look at all the footnotes. Um, so that, and, and in another way, there are two other books that I think I might point to that I still think have, I'm still rather pleased with this. I don't think what is my conversion book, actually, funnily enough? Um, I'm still pleased with that. It, it reflects a time. And um, it's, it's, I now think there's plenty in it that I would express very differently, but I do think it is a book that people still seem to find interesting and they like to talk to me about. And that gives me a chance to, to uh, talk about things that um, are important to me. And the other thing I think, and this is almost an afterthought that I'm still rather, um, rather pleased with, is something which, to quote David Hume about one of his books, fell pretty much dead born from the press, in other words, hasn't really had much interest, is my translation of Sitch Dalai Lama's erotic poetry, because I had great fun doing that. Um, and I still think they read rather well. Uh, not my field again. I did it to show I could do poetry as well as philosophy. And I used to, I remember, um, trying out some of the verses with, with Sharon and with Tara to see if, if from, a, from a female point of view, it was sufficiently sort of... And, and, and so I'm still rather pleased, with, rather pleased with that. I think they're, they're, they're amusing. But no, I don't think I've done anything that has any great enduring value, really. Um, it's sometimes I'm astonished that anyone's actually read things I've written. It sort of amazes. It's the thing about writing things, you know, then goes out there and then people read it sometimes, which is sort of a bit peculiar, really. <laughs> Do you have some future plans? Academic or otherwise? Both. Uh, um, definitely not academic. Um, future plans in life? As a Catholic, one should say sainthood. Um, but I don't know, I'm going to make that one either. So, um, no, I think um, uh, C.S. Lewis said the best is yet to come. Um, I'll be happy. No, I mean, I'll be happy to carry on being of some use, I think. Um, and, um, yeah, being able to, 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 um, to, to be of benefit and also to enrich my own, um, sort of spiritual awareness. I, I, I do remember back, you know, all those years ago in the, in, in, you find in the Vedas, the idea that when a person sees their son's sons, sorry about the sons, but they are their son's sons and their hair starts to get gray, they should enter sannyasa, I've renounced the world, um, and so more or less what I do, I've renounced the world, um, and then they should devote their time to, to a contemplation of Brahman, um, yeah, so, so, yeah, I think that, that, that's really what I do, I'd like to be able to say I had grander things, I'd like to be able to say, uh, to be able to speak fluently Italian, uh, or something like that, but, but no, I don't think so really, no, no, but definitely not writing books. Quite a number of people say to me, look, you know, you should still be writing books. Can't do it. No interest in doing it. Haven't got the energy to do it. Not what I want to do. Um, not really got anything I particularly want to say. Certainly not in Buddhist studies. And I don't think I've got anyone I want to read anything I want to say anyway. Uh, no, I'm very happy that you young folk can, can do that sort of thing. <laughs> And uh, Paul, we are contacting this project for contemporary and future generations of scholars and students. Would you have any message for them? Message for the future generations of scholars and students? Or us. Or you haven't. I think I've given messages, plenty of messages. I mean, to be able to study anything with real devotion. No, let me, I'm going to come back to that. But I, I remember I used to say to people who were thinking of studying at university as undergraduates, only study what you can be totally enthusiastic about, what you find endlessly interesting, what is burning, you know, what will really you get excited about. Don't ever study anything because someone has told you you should or um, you think it will be good, and certainly don't just study it because you think you're going to get a good career and you're going to make money out of it. 
because chances are you probably won't. Uh, only study things that are really you find exciting um, and, and, and that, that, you, you know, that you really get involved with. Um, also be aware that times will change, you will change, your studies will impact on you, um, but what you're doing in 20, 30, 40 years time might well not be what you're doing now. And, so, and, and be open to the fact that you might be thinking completely differently at that time. Um, and finally, I suppose, um, some, just to reiterate something I said earlier, um, always be aware of the broader context and that in the last analysis, um, uh, let me put it in a Christian way, in the last analysis you're not going to be asked how many texts you read. You're not going to be asked um, how many monasteries you visited. You're not going to be asked how many great Rinpoches you, you sat at the feet of. You're going to be asked, what did you do that made a difference, that made the world a better place, uh, that was worth doing, that, um, really, that, that really, really benefited people. And, um, uh, and I don't claim to have you know, done much of that, so I'm saying this as someone who hasn't um, to help, to, to exhort others and always um, remember that there is nothing wrong with having a clear um, position of your own, a clear moral and spiritual position of your own, and um, that, that you have come to yourself, while at the same time being, of course, accepting and tolerant of others, um, and never apologise for the fact that, yeah, this is what I think is true, or this is how I think one should behave. Um, be proud of that because I think there's a I think there's a tendency nowadays in you know, across the board really to to think that there's we need to um, avoid that sort of yeah. So so the key word is commitment. Yeah, that's the common word. Commitment, real commitment, where what you're committed to is something uh, something good. I use the word good more than worse because I was just thinking you know if I've been speaking in. 1933 in, 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 in Nuremberg, I might have spoken about commitment, but I wouldn't have been the sort of commitment I want people to have um, to the Nazi party or whatever. Um, you know, I mean, commitment to something that we all know what's good and what's bad, and we know what's good and what we should be committed to. And it's that that I'm talking about. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you Paul. Thank you. <laughs>